Um, and, uh, you know, we will record the session today and then we'll make that available uh, after for, for your own networks and your own volunteers. Um, so, as I say, this is the second uh, European Repair Cafe conference. We ran the first one last year with Martin and the Repair Cafe Foundation, where we had 110 uh, people attend. But as I mentioned, this time round, we've had at least 220 re repair cafes registered for this. So um, numbers are growing. Um, so the, the structure of the session will be uh, there'll be short introductions by myself and Martine from the Repair Cafe Foundation. Uh, and then we will have uh, a second session uh, around policy and um, uh, a presentation from Ada from the Commission about Repair Cafe Directive. And then a, a couple of, uh, you know, responses from a couple of repair cafes in terms of their uh, takeaways from the presentation and a bit of discussion. We'll then go into a second session on engaging youth in repair cafes and then uh, a, a final session with uh, a, a series of, of repair cafes who are at different stages of development from uh, one of the early repair cafes, one of the first 50 repair cafes to a, a very new repair cafe uh, and uh, that is coming from a very different perspective. And as always, I need to remember to thank our funders for this event. So this is the Strategic Priorities Fund of, from UKRI in the UK. So uh, that that is uh, that that's that point point ticked off the list. So uh, I'll now just pass across to Martine to introduce herself and to add any uh, any comments that she wants to make. Okay, thank you, Martin, and um, good afternoon or good morning from uh, wherever you're uh, joining this uh, session. It's great to see you all on this first more than European webinar. And uh, well, obviously not everyone from the community worldwide could join for in Australia and New Zealand. It's 3 a.m. at this moment. so understandably they couldn't make it. Um, however, we had many reactions from people who really wanted to join and are looking forward to seeing the recording. Um, and we have a very full program today with many repair cafes sharing their views on different subjects. And Martin has asked me to briefly tell about certain things that we as Repair Cafe International Foundation see emerge and um, several things that I see, um, well, first of all, I see, I still see after 13 years, the, the vitality and the continuous growth of the network, which is really picked up again after the pandemic. And many existing repair cafes have been very well visited ever since the reopening. And this is clearly a result of their long absence during the pandemic and possibly also a reaction to the cost of living crisis that we've been seeing uh, around the world. And in the last year, I had many calls from journalists who asked specifically about that. They wanted to know if people started to come to repair cafes more because they had less money to spend. And I always answer that may be one of the reasons, but it's it's not the only reason. There are many reasons to, to come to Repair Cafe. And the financial aspect is, well, to my knowledge, is not the main reason why people show up and why, why visitors uh, join. But of course, um, global developments are reflected in Repair Cafes too. For instance, last fall, we saw a sharp rise in the number of electric heaters being brought to repair cafes. And I believe this is a result of the war in Ukraine, which caused the gas prices to shoot up and, and people started to look for alternative ways to heat their homes. And in many countries, people rediscovered their electric heating elements, brought them down 
from the attic and found out that they didn't function well anymore and took them to a repair cafe. As a result of which repair cafe repairers in many countries have gained a lot of experience on repairing electric heaters. And another re development um, is the right to repair discussion, which is really gaining momentum among policymakers and in the media as well. Uh, in Europe, this has everything to do with the European Commission finally presenting their plans to tackle this issue. But in the United States and in Australia, we see the same thing. Things are still going slowly and the steps taken are small, but the topic is on the agenda. And I firmly believe that it's not going away, um, not very soon at least. Um, and this is an effect of all of you being visible in this community, striving for the same thing worldwide. We, we want to stop the throwaway society and we want to make it sustainable. We want a um, clean and safe and livable future for our children. And for that, we need repair skills to be preserved in, in communities, we need repairable products and we need rules to support repair. Um, so I want to thank you all for making this clear to policymakers and manufacturers and people in your community. And you can do this, and you actually already do this, by simply being in this movement and making repairs in your local repair cafe. For in doing so, you're contributing to the changes that we need, and that's wonderful. So keep doing that. Uh, and I really hope you'll enjoy this webinar um, and that you join in the discussion. And um, I'll stop talking now and let's go on to our next speaker who knows everything about the European right to repair plans. So, Martin, would you like to? introduce the next speaker so before we introduce the next speaker I, I, you know i've just got a couple of slides to just give a little bit of context before we go into into the presentation so get the slides working so as uh, martin said you know right to repair is is getting was has has been now embedded in the circular economy action plan that the commission passed a couple of years ago and is sort of moving forward we're seeing repair and reuse emerge now in even policy this is something i picked from the welsh government very recently and the welsh government have, have actually funded over a hundred repair cafe they funded a coordinator um, and they now have a uh, hundred uh, repair cafes in Wales as a as a country. We and I think we've seen different clusters in different countries, but in many ways it's still repair cafes are still sort of quite fragmented in that sense. And what's quite interesting is that repair cafes they sit at this sort of um, uh, the sort of connection between society and the economy we talk about circular economy a lot but what about circular society you know what is the role of citizens uh and so whilst we still own the products and the products are repaired it's you know it it moves the products have moved into to ownership by individuals um so often outside of the you know let's say the particularly if they're outside of warranty, they're now into a, you know, a different uh, stage. So there's this very interesting place that's, you know, that repair cafe sit within, maybe. And I've probably not got the full up to date figures here, Martin, but this is, I think, a couple of weeks ago, maybe it's a month ago, but it's the repair cafes are at least 2,700. I'm sure they're 2,800. And I think you that we recognize there are others that aren't yet registered on the site and you know so there's this is not a small number now um still a lot are in a uh, significant number in europe but they're you know martin as martin was as, was emphasizing 
you know, in North America and Australasia, particularly there, you know, the numbers are growing, um, at, at least compared to a few years ago. So explosive growth continues. And, and, and for, uh, uh, there was a lot of pent up um, activity that was stopped by COVID. And I think what what we're seeing, as I think Martin mentioned, is, and, and others were mentioning just in the, the pre-discussion, was a lot of new repair cafes emerging um, and, 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 well, new activity that was perhaps being thought about before COVID and then being sort of incubated, uh, now starting to happen. So just a survey that we did a couple of years ago that I thought might be useful as a as a quick comment here. We we did a survey um, with uh, University of Eindhoven, uh, working with between ourselves uh, and, and Martin, and uh, we found that there was, you know, generally within repair cafes, there's a sort of shared purpose and identity. So despite um, repair cafes not being connected in, in the sense, there is a sort of shared goal emerging, you know, and a shared identity. Um, prime, prime goal is around waste prevention. So hoping to get a product repaired. But a key thing that comes out of a lot of repair cafes is when people come out of repair cafes, there's tremendous sense of, the the citizen side and the civil society the community side um so most uh, most repair cafes are monthly in public buildings volunteers are you know between four and 20 customer levels between 10 and 30 concentration mainly in europe uh, there is different types of structures within repair cafes throughout Europe. Some have national structures and regional structures. Some are very diffuse that aren't really connected up. Essentially, repair cafes are highly, highly practical. Uh, most repair cafes don't uh, have a have a have a political role or um, as a perception of really getting heavily involved in campaigning as such. But but Martine and, and her team are quite quite, quite heavily involved in uh, you know the repair cafe you know in let's say the repair policy activities. Um, so so still at, at that level of repair cafe is on the ground very 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 practical. This was just a little survey we did in the UK, um, and we found that. Uh, we tried to rank the specific issues that were most interest to repair cafes. And we actually found uh, that, you know, that social value side was really, really high, actually, with a lot of repair cafes. And uh, other big issues were the ongoing issue around recruitment of, of, of volunteers, etc. But look at this slide again, if I was to do this again, there's a clear difference between um, and Martin and, uh, and I and others have had a lot of conversations about startup repair cafes. If you ask this question to startups, the big issue right at the top of that list will be access to insurance. So it depends a little bit on your your stage of development as to maybe what the topics are. But, but this is a sort of average, if you like. But the social dimension, community dimension is, is actually very important to a lot of repair cafes. So COVID hit us all. And that led to, you know, uh, you know, stopping of activity and, and, and sort of led to a movement from sort of what we might have recognized it's this to perhaps, you know, some of us lo looking at how we could operate when we we're able to come out and then shifting back into the mainstream again. So we've been through, repair cafes have been through quite a significant change. And I think at least for us as, as Farnham Repair Cafe, and we've run 80 sessions, it actually did lead to actually some level of innovation because we had to rethink things and redo things. And I think we've come out of COVID, if, like, if you like, fitter and, and with newer repairers. We've lost some, 
uh, but we not not sadly you know hope, hopefully I don't think we lost anybody physically through COVID but some people moved and stuff but um, we've heard so you had a regeneration and just the last thing I wanted to to to, to mention before we pass across to, to Ada is there is a link between uh, undertaking the repair and, and uh, uh, carbon reduction. So for those who aren't aware of it through our repair cafe and our activities, we'd be able to develop this free carbon, uh, repair carbon calculator to help calculate emissions from uh, physical repairs. And that's freely available to anybody. So if anybody is, isn't aware of that doesn't and wants to know more about that, please just get in contact with us. So I'll I'll shut up now and hopefully that's just give you a little bit of a, 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 a background before I pass to, across to Ada from the Commission. So over to you, Ada. Thank you so much uh, and thank you for this uh, very interesting introduction, something also to learn uh, for me. Uh, so uh, indeed, uh, my name is Ada, Ada Preciosi and I'm uh, working at the Director General for Justice and Consumers at the European Commission. And this is where we have developed um, the proposal uh, for a directive on uh, common rules promoting the repair of goods that is commonly called as the right to repair. Uh, and I would like to give you a little bit of context here. I think we can go a bit quicker through the slides in the sense that I'm not sure if all of them will be relevant to the audience, but let's see, let's see how it goes. Okay, so uh, starting with, with the bro um, broader context, because I see that indeed there are many participants here from outside of, uh, of Europe. Uh, so in the EU, uh, the Commission is working on a several um, policy priorities, and one of such priorities is the European Green Deal uh, that basically sets out very broad uh, environmental objectives. Uh, and then we have further policy documents such as Circular Economy Action Plan that Martin already mentioned earlier, and the Consumer Agenda, uh, and basically they do um, put forward uh, the measures that the Commission should work on um, in the coming years. And indeed, sustainable production, sustainable consumptions, these are uh, very valid points that are um, enumerated in both of these, of these documents. And so what is uh, our main purpose about uh, this, for, for this proposal uh, is basically to uh, encourage consumers to choose repair more often compared to replacement. So I think the next slide where I explain why we promote repair doesn't need to be explained here. I think we can skip this one and we can go to the next one, indeed, thank you. So something that is really important to bear in mind here is that um, indeed the right to repair can be understood in many different ways. And we have seen this before also when we were de developing the proposal and talking to stakeholders, they tend to also, depending on where they are coming from, um, they can expect different uh, things from this piece of legislation. However, it is important to, to indeed bear in mind that in the EU, we are working on this issue from a, a really broader uh, perspective. Because um, as you know, you know very well that there are different uh, bottlenecks to the right to repair a different level of supply chain. It is a very complex problem that cannot be just solved, uh, let alone with one legislation, but even with a number of legislations, this is not something uh, that can be uh, easily um, easily put into actually a, rea a reality to, to the consumers, the citizens. And so um, the commission is working on it from a, a more, uh, I would say, uh, horizontal, but also um, broader perspective and the first starting point in this context is the idea that in order to make a right to repair a reality we need to have products that are repairable by design because without this we cannot move any forward and so um, this is why the, the commission proposed a, a really important piece of legislation which is called the regulation on eco-design for sustainable products 
And basically, this uh, legislation uh, is a horizontal piece that will establish basically that uh, products that are placed on the EU market must comply with a number of requirements. And from now on, repairability and durability requirements will be a vital point of these product requirements that are absolutely necessary to be able to be placed on the EU market. Otherwise, it will be illegal to place them on the EU market, okay? So um, this is a horizontal piece of legislation. And then uh, afterwards, we will have a number of implementing measures that already exist for certain products, but will continue to, uh, to be elaborated and developed by the Commission to uh, this is the idea uh, in the near future to basically cover virtually all the products on the market. So this is like a very big framework. And now um, to give you an example, uh, in this product specific uh, pieces of legislation, uh, there will be some quite concrete obligations for producers. For example, on making spare parts available, which spare parts must be made available, for how long, to whom they must be made available. Uh, there are usually, um, there's a, usually a division between spare parts that must be made available to professional repairers and then also to end users. Um, then there are also requirements on disassembly, uh, repair instruction manuals. So all of these very specific product repair related information uh, would need to be provided by the producer. And this is already established and will continue to be established for uh, different categories of products on the base of that piece of legislation. I think this is very important to make a distinction between this piece of legislation and what we are proposing, what is often called as a right to repair. But as you can see, already a big part of it is covered by another commission initiative. So. Coming back to, to what I said earlier, so that was the first step. We need to have these products repairable by design. But then we move forward. What we want also, we want the consumers to be able to choose the repairable products. Once they are in the shop, they want to compare the products that are available there. And we want to empower them to be able to decide whether they want to presumably pay more, but have a more repairable and durable product or not. And for this, we need to uh, give consumers information about repairability and durability at the point of sale. And this is the objective of another commission initiative that also uh, our director general is working on. This is uh, called empowering consumers in the green transition. So this is the sales stage and the right to repair proposal that I want to talk about today is focusing on the use phase. We are targeting here the situation where consumer bought their product, they have it at home, and then it breaks. And we've seen that in most cases, consumers tend to replace such defective products for a wide number of reasons. Uh, and with this proposal, we wanted to increase the number of repairs on the market. Next slide, please. So indeed, uh, as I mentioned, the main objective here is uh, to focus on this moment in time when consumers have their broken product at home and they need to decide whether they will repair it or whether they will replace it. So this is why we are not focusing in this proposal on access to spare part or access to uh, repair information because this is usually not relevant for this particular um, for this particular decision making uh, moment next slide please okay so uh, how did we approach this and how do we want to promote repair well uh, in the eu uh, we already have a sort of a right to repair that concerns defects covered under the legal guarantee we are proposing one development there and then we have a number of measures that we are proposing that apply beyond the legal guarantee. Next slide please. 
So here again, to a little bit uh, explain what this legal guarantee is. So basically, the legal guarantee is the framework under which in the EU, the consumer has a right uh, to uh, claim from the seller repair or replacement of the good if it is defective and if the defect existed at the point of delivery. And the minimum period of time it is applicable in most member states in the EU is two years. So within these two years, if the product breaks and it is uh, and it, it was already there at the delivery, uh, then the consumer can go to the seller and say whether they want to have this product repaired or replaced. And now what we have seen in the study that we prepared for, uh, for developing uh, this proposal, we've seen that in such situations, consumers um, to a large extent tend to opt for replacement. They are not interested that much in repair. And so in order to uh, shift this, uh, with our proposal, uh, we are um, saying that sellers would be obliged to repair if costs of repair uh, would be uh, cheaper or uh, it would be at least as costly as replacement. So if repair is economically making sense for the seller, and as we know, is good for the environment, then the choice of consumer should be reduced. So in this situation, normally consumers should not be able to have the product replaced unless, and here, again, is the tricky part, unless it causes significant inconvenience to the consumer. So we wanted to strike the balance here between uh, focusing more on, on promoting repair and environmental goals, but at the same time, not to reduce consumer rights too much. Therefore, uh, in a situation where, for example, um, the consumer asks to have the product replaced, the seller says, no, it will be cheaper for me uh, and it's better for the environment to repair, I will repair it, but if repair would last for a very, very long time, uh, then this could be considered under the, um, the proposal that this is causes significant inconvenience and consumer could still then in this case to ask to replace the product instead of repairing them. So this is what we are covering within the legal guarantee. This is the only measure. And then what we cover beyond is on the next slide. There are three um, basically main elements. So the first element refers to the European repair information form. Uh, the second one on obligation to repair for producers and to inform about repair uh, options and the online platform that is, uh, that is uh, targeting uh, member states. So let's start maybe with the European Repair Information Form. And the next slide. Mm -hmm. So uh, here the idea was that uh, we have seen in, in uh, the study that um, prepared uh, the directive, the impact assessment for this directive, that consumers lack sufficient information about the repair services. They often are not able to, to compare properly such services. And so uh, we are uh, proposing to give them the right to request this uh, European repair information form from any repairer. And the form is, the template for the form is already provided in the annex. And basically it would provide for main characteristics of the repair service. So it would say what kind of defect this concerns and uh, what would be the duration for repair, what would be the price of repair, um, and then any other uh, offers uh, or other conditions that the repairer can offer, for example, uh, some sort of guarantee uh, after the repair or providing a replacement product during repair all of these issues could be mentioned there in order to for the repairer to, to promote their, their services. And the idea is that this form, the conditions would be valid for 30 days so that the consumer could take it, could go to another repairer and then compare uh, and uh, find a repairer that suits best their needs. Next slide, please. Yes, the obligation to, uh, to repair. Next slide. So this is basically, uh, one could say, the core of the proposal. Um, so we are proposing that producers of certain goods, goods for which there are already repairability requirements, would be required to 
offer repair to consumers. So what does this mean in practice? So as I said that on the basis of this eco design measures, there are uh, already certain products that are covered and that are indicated in the annex to our proposal. We are talking here, for example, about fridges, dishwashers, washing machines. Now, since a couple of weeks, also smartphones, um, tablets. For this type of products, there are already set in place repairability requirements. Uh, one of the most prominent requirements is that for all of these products, a number of spare parts must be made available for a specific period of time. Uh, usually it's somewhere between five to 10 years. And so for these products, manufacturers will have to offer repair. Um, they will also have to inform consumers about this obligation. And as, uh, as I mentioned on the previous slide, as any other repairer, if they decide to repair, they will have to provide European repair information form. Uh, now, I say if they will repair because they are also allowed to subcontract this. So they could decide that other independent repairers uh, would uh, carry out this obligation for them. Now, what is very important here to note and uh, what is a major difference compared to a legal guarantee situation. Yeah, I said, sorry. Mm -hmm. I people remind you to do, uh, thank you very much. Is it fine? Can I proceed? Yeah, yeah, please, please continue. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Um, so the, the main difference here with the legal guarantee, because within the legal guarantee, um, since it covers the defects that were only uh, present at the delivery, uh, normally the framework of the legal guarantee is that the remedy is always for free. So the repair or replacement is always for free for the consumer. Now here, under this producer's obligation to repair, uh, basically, the producer will have to cover, uh, to, to offer repair for all sorts of defects that can happen to the product. So not only defects that are there at the delivery, but even if I buy a new smartphone and after five days I accidentally drop it on the floor and the screen is broken, uh, now under this new, uh, new um, obligation, the producer will have to offer repair of this. But since it covers also these kind of defects that are completely not a fault of producer, but are caused by the consumer itself, they are allowed to charge a price for it. So it's not going to be for free. This is the main difference with um, the repair under, uh, under the legal guarantee. And uh, as I mentioned earlier, so for the moment, uh, we have decided in the proposal that we do not mention a specific period of time during which this obligation applies. Um, because the timing should be uh, aligned with the period of time for which spare parts must be made available under the specific product safety, uh, product specific, uh, sorry, um, pieces of legislation. So if a piece of dishwasher must be made available for uh, seven years or eight years, then for this period of time, the producer will have to repair such good. Next slide, please. And then the final uh, element is uh, the online platform. Final slide. Thank you. So um, here, the, 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 um, let's say the problem that we were trying to, to tackle was the fact that uh, we've seen that consumers many times they have um, problems to actually figure out where they can repair product. Um, whether repairer, uh, for example, deals with certain brands or um, whether um, what are actually the, the, the prices for repair. Uh, so we have proposed that member states uh, should establish at least one national online repair platform with a variety of search functions. And through the search functions, uh, consumers would be able to find as close as possible to them the repairer uh, that can repair their products. Uh, and also, they should be able to uh, request this uh, repair form directly through the platform uh, online. Um, what is also important there is that um, we say in the recitals of the proposal that um, these platforms 
depending on on the on the decision of the member states could be also extended to repair cafes so um, they could be also advertise um, they can advertise themselves on this uh, on this platform if member states decide to to do so apart from repairers on the platform there also needs to be a possibility to search for sellers of refurbished goods and also companies that want to buy defective products from consumers in order to refurbish them. So I think this is the core of the proposal. Without taking too much more time, I will be happy to answer if you have any questions. Thank you. Martin, you're on mute. Indeed, a classic Zoom conference problem. Well so, so whilst I have you on the on the line, John, maybe uh, per, uh, perhaps John, if you might want to kick off with any observations or questions or thoughts, uh, you know, for Ada. Right. Okay. I really, I really stuck myself into that, didn't I? <laughs> I, was, I, was, I was thinking, I was thinking, I was going to ride on the back of uh, Tom Hansing's uh, great thoughts. Okay, I've got a few. Uh, Ada, thank you very much. That's 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 brilliant, and it's and it is nice to see. Um, I think there are some issues with this in translation to repair cafes. Um, certainly, the things we seem to fix, I don't think, are economic to repair. Um, most of them and so there's a there's a big issue around the costs I think um, if we deal with the main components of the thing of this uh, of this standard you, 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 you're talking about um, perhaps you could answer a couple of questions really the, the repair information form do you think you see the, the there's another issue here for repair cafes sorry Martin I'll try and keep this reasonably short um, but the um, the issue we've got is that we don't we don't work on a, a homogenous and a, and a, and a repeatable uh, scope of equipment, so we we we, we don't know what we're getting in. Um, so we we would struggle to put a repair form or to 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 comply with a repair form unless it said something like um, if you can bring it in the door and it's not uh, and it's not full of petrol we'll 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 have a look at it uh, and we'll have a look at it for free but but that would pretty well cover all of the all of the items that we would we would be prepared to look at from clothing to electronic goods to bicycles you know anything um so i'm just wondering do, do you see flexibility in that form maybe something just to clarify indeed already yeah. to to preempt the questions uh, the proposal, as such, does not apply to repair cafes because ah. the repairer, the definition of a repairer, uh, I mean, unless you fall under the definition of a repairer, but it would mean that you need to uh, have a professional, you are a professional uh, sort of repairer. So this is your business activity from which you are making profit. So in my understanding, many repair cafes do not fall under this uh, this concept so if you are not okay. fulfilling this uh, obligation uh, this this uh, these uh, conditions then the basically the directive doesn't apply to you at all the only part that applies uh, where you can benefit from it actually so it can be only positive for you uh, is indeed uh, what I mentioned about the platforms so you might be able to have a possibility to promote yourself on the online national platform if the members is decide that uh, such a platform is also open to sort of uh, this uh, community initiatives uh, such as repair cafes. Okay, right. Thank you. Sorry about that. I I, I read somewhere, and I, I was just trying to find it, um, that there was there was some uncertainty about repair cafes because it was talking about maybe that's the scope of one of the other directives um oh, i can't see it now okay don't worry let's move on on that um okay so the online repair platform that sounds like a good idea um uh i think it might be complex um but I think if, if if there is a way, do, do you have do you have views of, of 
how that will be promoted nationally. Um, because with the, 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 the sort of the way the internet goes these days, um, it, no. it's, it's, a, it's a complex thing to control. I, I, I do see, I, of course, I do see a challenge there. Yeah. Uh, so I have to say that um, this is something what, that we have proposed. Um, but there is a lot uh, going on at the moment. Uh, because as you know, the, the, the Commission, I mean, the, the European decision-making process works in the way that the Commission proposes, comes up with a proposal. And then this proposal goes immediately to the European Parliament and to the Council that represents the member states. And then they come up with a lot of their ideas and amend what has been proposed by the Commission. And these, uh, these elements that, uh, that uh, you are raising also have been already raised. So at the moment it is true that um, in the original proposal we have sort of delegated this role to the member states to promote, to raise awareness on about the platform uh, and it would be normally up to them to decide how they want to do it uh, we at the, as, as the commission we could also uh, carry out some promotional campaigns uh, awareness raising campaigns um, but again there are also some other talks that uh, we don't know maybe uh, the solution could be that there could be some EU website that would give links to all the national platforms. Uh, there's still a lot that can happen there. Uh, so it's a little bit now too early to say where we will end up with this. Um, mm -hmm. But we also, our hands are tied to some extent because indeed, uh, um, I'm not sure what we could say by law to clarify and to make sure that there is a sufficient um, information about this available to consumers. Maybe you have some ideas. Um, well, I, my, my only ideas were that there are some organizations existing like the Repair Cafe Foundation, like, mm. uh, but of course these, these, are, these are, so from what you're saying, these are slightly peripheral to this because you are aiming mainly at professional repairers. If that's the case, uh, what I would say is that um, there's a fundamental shift needed first before this can bed in. And that is rather like Austria is doing in the, you know, the funding or through vouchers and things uh, to promote repair because the, the economic balance is not in the favor of repair at the moment because most of our goods are imported uh, they are produced many times automatically with minimal input or with cheap labor and the then the repair will not be economic so um, hence the same yeah it's... absolutely absolutely and I mean on this uh, it, it was a difficult way I would say to balance what's in the proposal and of course the question of costs is sort of silent there because it's very difficult to tackle. And yeah. th there are reasons for which we decided not to say that the repair must uh, take place for a reasonable price or uh, affordable price, because these are words that again, mm, they, they lack uh, sufficient meaning. Uh, and uh, so what we have tried to focus is on other elements. And it's true, we do not specify um, clearly the issue of incentives because we believe that this is a matter for national uh, law and so what member states want to decide also because the cost of repair uh, okay they, they they do depend on cost of spare parts but again they do depend in a lot uh, in, in a large extent also in um, to the, uh, on the on the labor costs and then the labor costs are something completely national um, and so it, there was not enough space for us, we believe, to really interfere, uh, interfere in that zone. But just to let you know, we uh, have already received the European Parliament and the, one of the committees that is responsible for the file already prepared a draft report in which they suggest certain amendments. And these amendments are there indeed for the member states to, to put in place certain financial incentives like the one in Austria. So yeah. it's, it's, it's in development.
Okay, well, that, 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 that's, that's great. And th thanks, John, for, for kicking it off. And, and maybe I can sort of pass across to Tom. Um, did, did you have any observations or questions or comments? Yes, uh, sure, I have. Thanks for the possibility to speak here. Um, the first thing I want, would like to say is about the, the repair obligation during the um, legal warranty. Because what is happening, in fact, with the proposal of the EU, EU Commission is a limitation of rights for the consumers. Because how could they have insight on the real repair costs? There is nothing to find about transparency there. And if the manufacturer says, oh, repair is too cost intensive for me, then a manufacturer producer could go on by replacing goods. So before that, it was able, uh, the, the consumer was in, in charge to choose and the, uh, the manufacturer, the producer had to show if it's too uh, it's if it's not economically viable. And this is, in fact, not something that helps uh, consumers to choose more repair, but it limits their rights to, uh, to, 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 to take their right. It's a limitation of rights of the consumers, in fact. Uh, so the general criticism about the EU, EU proposal is that it's very, very uh, manufacturer and producer oriented. It's not for the not for the people it's not for the environment it's not for the planet but it's for the, for the the manufacturers that try to 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 save their profit in okay it's very very hardly spoken but this is uh, what i uh, think about that in fact this so this is the one thing the limitation of consumer rights and uh, the obligation for repair after the legal warranty is only for a very few set of, um, of products. Maybe it's not enough time to wait for all the different categories of uh, products till this is made uh, possible. In, you know, it maybe takes much too much time to, to go on like this. So what is inside the EU directive on eco design is part of this uh, obligation to repair after legal warranty. Maybe this is too slow. I think it's too slow. So it's too less, to, a, a very small set of items um, is, is meant by this. And um, the third thing, I, I try to use hard words because the, the matching repair platform, um, it's good for the, for the, um, prof the so-called professional market. It's good for the people who, who, who make the money with repair business and repair service. But to say it's helpful to promote uh, repair cafe activities, and this is something that is like uh, to clap hands, this is, I think, the, the wrong perspective. What is actually happening in the repair cafe movement and the repair movement worldwide is self-defense. It's, it's a society in self-defense mode on the failure of market and state. That's fact. You know, we, the, the, the non-commercial repairers, the, what is happening in repair cafes is they tackle an, a really, really threatening challenge on how to, to use and um, to, to how to deal with the goods. And um, it's not for profit. It's because it makes sense to repair products and to use them longer. And as uh, the, um, uh, the speaker before said, um, the, 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 the bigger part of the products that are repaired in the repair cafe, they don't make, the, the repair is not the, a, um, a profitable business there you know the, the maybe, th maybe, maybe tom we can give for time we can give a, a an opportunity to respond to a number of your points because time is uh we've only got yeah. about another five to ten minutes and we've got another speaker so okay so i can, maybe, I can maybe... close this with this because but that, that's the point so the, the the repair cafe movement does not need promotion it needs to be not needed anymore Yes, uh, thank you. Uh, so, uh, indeed, no, I, I completely uh, hear all your points. These points have been also raised by, by other stakeholders. However, let's take uh, note of what I said before, that indeed this proposal doesn't have as an objective to promote repair cafes. 
Okay, so this is something that we need to acknowledge. And the Commission is promoting repair cafes also via different instruments. I don't know if you know uh, about the recent uh, proposal just from, uh, from last month. Uh, it's a council recommendation uh, where basically um, member states would be encouraged indeed to, to invest and to develop in uh, invest in developing and upgrading of societal skills on repair. Uh, digital skills, circular skills. So this, as I, I, I would believe that your activities would fall much more under under this 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 recommendation there. Uh, and indeed, if there are financial incentives to repair, I presume that they could also be open open to you. Now, on the specific uh, aspect of the proposal, reduction of consumer rights. Absolutely, I agree. And this is a question that we have to ask. We had to ask ourselves what is more important at a certain point. Do we want to continue as is and seeing that consumers replace the products within the legal guarantee 90 percent or we want to boost more repairs? This is a value choice, policy choice that, as you can imagine, many member states are, are against such a solution because indeed they are against the reduction of consumer rights. However, as I said, we believe that this is a balanced approach because still, if repair takes longer, um, then um, consumers still have a um, possibility to replace the product. And what is important, because I think you mentioned producer, uh, legal guarantee in the EU has nothing to do with the producer. It's only against the seller. Um, now on the, uh, on the slow progress, uh, indeed, again, uh, uh, we had a big debate to what extent we should uh, basically what should be the scope of this proposal on this obligation to repair. And what we had to weigh is that on one hand, if we open up the scope, uh, then we would end up with uh, consumers going to producers saying that they want to uh, have a product repaired and then the repairer, uh, the producer would say, well, it's impossible to repair. And the consumer has no right to, to, to claim whether or not this is true. If we have reparability requirements um, that the, the producers have to comply with by law anyhow, there's no way for them to say that it's impossible to repair because it is possible. Otherwise, they would not be allowed to put these products on the market. And yes, the scope is restricted for the moment, as I said. New, uh, new categories of products will be added. But again, this is a policy choice. This is also something that we see uh, the parliament uh, is trying to extend. We will see the member states have also different approaches to this. So I would say that this is still, uh, uh, as, as with many uh, actually other elements, it's a, it's a starting of a discussion, I would say, and we will see where all of this will, will balance out. But uh, again, these are all, all, all valid points and we did not come up with this without taking a further look and really analyzing uh, the pros and cons of different options. I we have some final comments from Pierre or, and or Gilles uh, from, uh, from Paris. Yes. Uh, this is Gilles uh, speaking from uh, Repair Café Paris. Um, well, what, what we see here, we, we are volunteers and uh, we, uh, we repair freely and uh, everything is free. And, uh, and uh, what we see is there is um, a problem related to the cost and the value of uh, repairing. I mean that... Um, when it's cheaper to buy a coffee machine than to uh, well spend two or three hours in a in a repair cafe waiting for your uh, your fixing at, uh, of your of your machine, well, we can't. We, there's no competition in this. There's, there's only a social uh, gesture from the the person that wants the the, the machine fixed and um, we try to work on this as well to make people understand the real value of the reparation in the sense that uh, with less waste with less uh, health uh, cost related to pollution then um, it makes life better to everyone and uh, and this is a very sensitive uh, question and I don't think that as long as it costs uh, 10 or 15 euros to uh, buy a, a new uh, coffee maker or a new toaster, or then um, it, it, won't, uh, it won't be um, profitable. 
and uh, for uh, for uh, businesses to uh, to offer repairs. Uh, we can't compete. We can only compete if we are volunteers and we we do this on social grounds and um, working on the on the effect on uh, mobilizing people and uh, making people understand uh, what uh, what is the value of the reparation. Uh, unless you have a specific re response to that, I, I, maybe we can, uh, you know, uh, thank, thanks for all the comments and, and, and uh, uh, your presentation. I mean, one thing that I just wanted to uh, bring up is that I guess there's something here about the goal and right to repair originally started as a sort of citizen driven initiative from US across to Europe. And, and, I, and I guess repair cafe activity in in Europe now is not insubstantial. You know, maybe of the two thousand seven hundred, probably maybe to eighty percent are in Europe, and the numbers are growing quite significantly. So you do on actually on a monthly basis actually have a lot of repair cafe activity going on so and particularly the average repair cafe rate is about 63 percent so you've got a lot of repair activity going on in the informal sector uh you know driven by students so they're sitting outside the economy and in the society if you like and i think uh perhaps it's something to for, for the commission to further think about because it's not uh, it's it's not small activity now. Yes, it was maybe ten years ago, but as I think Martin was mentioning, there's repair cafes, of, you know, many opening now on a weekly basis. So the activity is is only going one way. So I think it's it's it is perhaps something that's worthy of, of, of more consideration by the Commission, even if it's at the level of, you know, balancing manufacturer and consumer citizen, but also how the platform could be used as a, as a, I think you said yourself, as a communications mechanism to make citizens aware of that repair cafes exist. No, no, absolutely. And I think what what we need to also bear in mind, because I understand that, of course, you are heavily involved in this activity on a day to day basis. Uh, and as you said, it does grow, it keeps on growing. Right. Um, but we need to remember that. Uh, we cannot, as I said at the beginning, do everything in one piece of legislation. So uh, I think that if you look at the speed and the numbers of commission proposals that are there on the table, uh, it's, it's where we are making an incredible effort in trying to move things forward. And I think we need to all acknowledge that I understand the expectation because the expectation is high. And this is a very important for citizens, for everyone, for the environment. Uh, but we need to take this step-by-step -step approach. So uh, as, as Martin said also earlier at the very beginning, this is just the beginning also for us. It's, it's important. The topic is growing and growing. And I don't think it's going to um, become less, uh, less popular anytime soon. So we have years to come and these things will just progress and we will develop it. We will amend the legislation. And, uh, slowly but uh, little by little hopefully we will make the re right to repair re reality but indeed we need to acknowledge that uh, these things unfortunately take some time and they cannot be done um, at once we have uh, procedures in the in the eu and then it takes time before the member states put in place in legislation so unfortunately this is it's true a lengthy a lengthy process no, absolutely. I mean, you've got the new legislation and then you've got the integration of the repairability in the existing legislation, particularly in the electronic sector. So uh, so I think, you know, the, the, the issue for many of us who are at the front line is we see very few products that are designed for repairability. And so it's going to take some time uh, for us to start to see in repair cafes those first range of products that are uh, and there's going to be a lot of legacy products coming through repair cafes. So 
I think by 2035, 2040, there's still going to be a need for repair cafes. I don't see suddenly overnight a little bit, as you're saying, that design for repairability is going to suddenly get fully integrated into design and development departments. But anyway, ongoing discussion, perhaps, uh, you know, be, uh, you know, uh, interesting to hear th how things progress. So thank you very much again for your time and thank you very much for the uh, the speakers and their comments. We're now going to move on to uh, discussion around the youth uh, um, aspects of uh, repair cafes. And to start off, we have a video from a lady from the Netherlands who is uh, 23 and she set up a repair cafe. So hopefully the technology is going to work and we're going to be able to hear her Hello, video. I will uh, tell you something about Repair Cafe Bullock, uh, a local repair cafe in the Netherlands and my experiences in setting up and running a repair cafe. Oh. A repair cafe. But first, I will quickly introduce myself. So, my name is Lynn. I was 23 years old when I started a local repair cafe in Bunnock. I study industrial design and work as user experience designer at a design agency. And when preparing the presentation, I was thinking. When did I first hear about a repair cafe? Three years ago, I was watching a vlog on YouTube from Nim. Everyone, I will uh, tell you something about Repair Cafe Bullock, uh, a local repair cafe in the Netherlands, and my experiences in setting up and running a repair cafe. But first, I will quickly introduce. First, I will quickly introduce myself. So, my name is Lynn. I was 23 years old when I started a local repair cafe in Bunnock. I study industrial design and work as user experience designer at a design agency. And when preparing the presentation, I was thinking, when did I first hear about a repair cafe? Three years ago, I was watching a vlog on YouTube from Ming Plus and she films her daily life, and one day she visited a repair cafe in Amsterdam with her family. And that video was the start of my repair cafe journey. Quickly after I was introduced to the repair cafe concept, I got the idea of launching my own repair cafe, and I just started with my graduation projects, and we were in lockdown due to COVID, so I had plenty of time. I started uh, searching for collaboration partners to help me with a location and the finances. And finally, I started a partnership with the local library. Oh, and in the meantime, I pursued my bachelor degree. When I found a partner, I received funding from the city of Bunnock to cover all costs for the initial stages. And in June, it was, ta uh, it was about time to make my initiative public. An article in the local newspaper was published to announce the launch and search for volunteers. So we started with eight volunteers and since September, we organize monthly repair events. Um, well, now I will elaborate a bit more about Repair Café Bunnock itself. So Repair Café Bunnock is located in the city of Bunnock. The city of Bunnock consists of three towns, Bunnock, Odijk and Werkhoven, and has about 16,000 citizens. Bunnock is very active in local uh, initiatives and we highly value sustainability. And as you can see on the map, we are surrounded by repair cafes. So I was wondering, why don't we have one? So, the first month was really observing what kind of audience are attracted to the repair cafe. And after organizing repair events for almost two years, we can conclude that the repair cafe is a great success. Visitors from all ages know where to find us. And I really like the diversity. 
and it makes me proud when parents and grandparents, often grandfathers, visit the repair cafe with their children and grandchildren. So our visitors have various motivations to uh, visit our repair cafe. Some just can't afford a new product. Others are highly motivated to repair their product uh, for sustainability purpose. Even though repairing a product costs more than buying a new one. But visitors also come to repair the product because of the emotional value. And the social elements is also very important especially for some older adults. We organize our repair uh, events at a central location. We use a big hall at a brand new building complex where the local library, uh, multiple schools and the music schools are located. The location was really helpful, especially at the beginning because visitors of the library or music school walk by and notice us. And out of curiosity, they ask what we are doing and often they come back another time with their broken product. And our location is also ideal for children. It allows them to read a book in the library or play at the schoolyard when they have to wait or lose their interest, as sometimes repairing can take so much. <laughs> oh, and um, a fun fact. We noticed a slight increase of people with children when the toy library nearby is also open. So we started with eight volunteers and along the way we learned what kind of problems uh, people have and what kind of repair skills and knowledge we need. So our team extended and at this moment our team consists of 16 volunteers. Uh, volunteers applied via Facebook. An examen, a local volunteer platform, and just walked in during repair events. We have 11 repairers with various uh, knowledge. The uh, think about repairing electrical appliances, clocks, or sharpening garden shears. We also have two clothing experts and three hosts, including myself. As you can see, a lot of our volunteers are of working age. One week ahead, everyone can sign up for the upcoming repair event. And this makes volunteer work at our repair cafe flexible and easy to combine with their busy lives. At the age of 25, I'm the youngest in our team. And our oldest volunteer is 76. The rest is below 70. The distribution of ages resulted in a wide range of repair expertise, but I have to admit that our oldest repairers can repair almost everything. Well, um, one of my goals was reaching a diverse audience, but how can we reach them? The city of Bunnik helped us through uh, their connections with local organizations, and for example, the Schademantel supported our initiative by sharing our content among their audience, and that is mainly teenagers and their parents. Using various channels from other organizations, we got exposed to a wide audience uh, who didn't know about or were not specifically interested in, in the repair cafe. Um, of time, I've put a lot of effort in new collaborations to extend our services and find creative ways to get the attention. They are mapped in this ecosystem. So, for example, in collaboration with Repair Café Utrecht Oost, and last year even with a uh, professional from the Slijperij, we organized an annual garden tool set special where visitors can sharpen their garden shears. This is very popular. Uh, furthermore, we are planning a bee hotel workshop with a young furniture maker. During uh, the workshop, participants learn and make a bee hotel, and they get familiar with our repair events at the same time. We also actively participate in the National Zero Waste Week from uh, Milieu Centraal. During that week, we have a very low threshold activity plans, and participants can get a sustainable present from one of our partners during the repair event. 
it is a creative way to get a lot of publicity and the little present is a powerful incentive for people to visit a repair cafe for the first time. Um, we are also visible at fairs. For example, we presented at the local sustainability market, which attracted more than 150 uh, visitors. And in September, we have a spot at the local volunteer fair. So we also invest in offline promotion. Um, in collaboration with different partners, we designed, printed and distributed posters, flyers, business cards, and even street displays. This and the local newspaper really help to get the attention, but at the end, word of mouth is most efficient. Further, we use Instagram and Facebook as our main channels, uh, where we share upcoming repair events, actions, repair tips, and experiences. But our best reach rates are in local Facebook communities, with over one and a half thousand members and even uh, and event posts on the Google business page. So thank you for listening. Um, obviously, you don't have to do it all, but I hope you get inspired uh, by how many ways you can reach uh, people and just be creative and try things out. We also still experimenting. Um, if you have any questions, don't hesitate to reach out to me. Thank you. Mm. Everyone, oh, I will uh, tell you something about Repair Cafe Bullock, uh, a local repair cafe. Sorry, I'm going to try and move this forward. <laughs> so I think we have a, a challenge there to find the youngest repair cafe developer in the world. So I think Lynn is as far as we can see the youngest so she started at 23 it's now 25 but if anybody else is aware of anybody else who set up a repair cafe who's younger than that please let i'm sure martine would be very interested to know that i'd certainly be very interested to know that so unfortunately lynn couldn't be with us because she's uh on holiday at the moment so i'll now pass across to to kathy um you know for her uh, observations and thoughts on the on, on youth and engagement. Hi everybody, I'm thrilled to be here. I'm just absolutely thrilled to be in your company this afternoon. Um, I, I this dovetails really nicely with Lynn's comments, um, and I too, uh, you know, am very admirable of being 23 and starting a repair cafe. Um, my comments today are going to be more directed at the age group, you know, probably young teens to like early 20s. Um, that's kind of my sweet spot. Um, I'd be happy to talk about, you know, engaging young, younger folks um, and feel free to contact me about that if you want to engage in that discussion, because there's a lot to be said there as well. Um, but this particular age group is uh, an age group that I work with quite a bit in my work with the Rockland County Youth Bureau. Um, we're a part of local government. We're a small community right in the suburbs of New York City. And one of the core principles of the Youth Bureau here is um, lifting youth voices at any opportunity. Um, we believe in youth empowerment. We believe that any activity or accomplishment or initiative that in, is inclusive of youth voice or consideration or feedback will take anything from good to great. And in my work with the Youth Bureau over the years, um, my primary focus has been environmental, conservation, food sustainability, um, workplace readiness, career skills, and the like. So the intersection between uh, my concentration and being at the Youth Bureau um, fits really nicely with the Repair Cafe model. And with that, uh, if you would advance the slide. Next slide. Thank you. So what presentation would be complete without a motivational quote? Um, and this one says, we cannot always build the future for our youth, but we can build our youth for the future. And I chose this for many reasons. It's, uh, the metaphor is, is very uh, relevant to Repair Cafe and uh, conservation issues and youth development. Um, particularly significant is the word build, because when we think about Repair Cafe, we think about building relationships, intergenerational relationships, 
building skills, um, and of course the bigger uh, meaning of the whole repair cafe movement, which is to repair and heal the environment and make more sustainable sustainable future for everybody. Young people absolutely understand that big mission. Um, they are living climate change in real time. Um, they have that, it's, in, it's ingrained in them. However, the practical part of Repair Cafe is what's gonna deliver them to the meeting, the greater meeting. They are tactile young people. In fact, when I um, am interviewing young people for my programs, uh, one of the questions that I always ask them is, what's your learning style? And they always, 9.9 .9 times out of 10, out of the several hundred young people that I've um, interviewed, will always say, I'm a tactile learner. I'm a visual learner. Show me and I'll learn it. Um, they, you know, that's really their primary uh, initiative in terms of like how they're going to intake the world. So that is really important. So again, while the bigger meaning is there, you know, the, the way you're gonna deliver your message to young people is through the practical and the tactile, but you first have to get them in your door. So that's, that's your number one goal is just get them in there, get them through the door. So that will take us to our next slide. which is getting them in the door. Um, this is highly you know, practical. The first reason, you know, you, and the first way you're gonna get them through the door is by making all of your outreach relatable to young people. Um, make them feel welcome. You are going to put it on all your outreach at, at, you know, material. It's, this is a youth-friendly event. This is a youth and family-friendly event. You're gonna put it in your press releases, in your social media outreach. This is gonna you know, make them feel welcome. Um, you're going to go to schools and have relationships with schools, you know, just like Lynn was talking earlier, you know, making things as visible to schools as possible. Clubs, scouts, um, anything that has to do with anything tactile or artistic, you can kind of, you know, make relationships with, with teachers and administrators um, to bring young people into Repair Cafe. Um, that's that's going to be one of the things that you got to do to get them there. Um, next slide. But you're going to want to take that one step further. You need to cultivate relationships with other agencies that are youth inclusive. So one of the very, very first institutions that we collaborated with and came out of the gate was a local vocational school called Rockland BOCES. BOCES um, has many different um, aspects to their schools, but computer repair, um, troubleshooting is one of them. And are out of the, all the repair cafes that we have done, there's only one repair cafe that they haven't been at. So they come to my repair cafe, they set up their booth, they have everything that they need. It's, you know, I've, I've never had to recruit a, com a computer fixer or a handheld device fixer since my relationship with them. You know, it's, it, I consider them a sponsor of the event. So vocational schools, um, colleges are really important to develop relationships with, universities, the professors that teach classes because as you all know, there's so many relevant topics when it comes to Repair Cafe. You know, it's, it's essentially field work for a, a student. They can do communications field work, teaching, of course, repair, anything like that is going to be uh, something that brings reciprocity. It's going to bring, um, you know, uh, benefits to the schools as well as us and the young people as well. So anything STEAM related, um, in, in the United States, we have AmeriCorps, Peace Corps is, you know, a kind of like a, a, a global uh, core, but anything that is a service learning youth agency is going to be some place that you want to cultivate partnerships with in order to continue a sustainable relationship and, and having um, young people come and be repair coaches and assistants, et cetera. Next slide. So I want to return to the, the need to make um, young people feel welcome. And that starts at your intake. When you're, you, you know, you're putting out the word of that you want young people there, you're going to start getting responses from youth. Um, their, you know, their preferred method is going to probably be text or email. I just do email um, as well as phone. So for any general population, you don't have to be a young person to be terrified by making phone calls. Um, nobody really, really likes to do it. Um, email can also be pretty in intimidating for a younger person who, you know, it might be communicating a lot by text. You know, you're probably going to get communications that are kind of, um, you know, they don't fully have all their information, but you just have to respond to them um, with, with open arms. And when you're, you know, engaging youth, especially ones that might be a little bit timid to kind of enter the process of, uh, you know, volunteering with you, 
you, your warmth, you have to exude warmth and efficiency. So what I mean by efficiency is, you know, when you have, when you engage a young person and you, uh, you want them to be part of the repair cafe movement, you get them on the phone or you're emailing them, you're asked, I don't use applications for this because I think it's just an impediment to the process. I use my relationship with them to develop, um, what their what their kind of goal is are they good at you know fixing something or repair or they don't know you know so that's my intake when it comes to them but you're going to have to you know kind of assess that beforehand it, to the best of your ability um and then when it comes to the event you're also going to have to do um, introductions uh, to all the repair coaches to um, the layout to everything and uh you know all of those that outreach and that you know being the best host at a party for a young person, so to speak, you want your, your guests to feel comfortable. Um, and in this case, you know, both comfortable and, and useful and needed. Um, all of those aspects are going to be really important to the welcoming process. Um, like I said, you're going to want to put them with repair coaches and have a floor manager that also are empathetic to youth. I will be honest with you, your first hour of your repair cafe, if you have a lot of young people participating, will probably be a hot mess. Um, I think most people in the first hour of their um, repair cafe sometimes are a hot mess until you get your groove. Um, it's almost like setting up a chessboard. You know, you want to set it up and then you want to, um, you know, move your pieces strategically. With young people, um, you know, if you put the organized young people who are uh, positive and, you know, you can put that in your welcome table. You can, you know, put the, you know, some young people as fix it uh, assistance. Uh, set up, break down, working with kids, you know, like you are going to move your chess pieces throughout the time. So you might find that you've placed a young person and they're starting to gravitate someplace else. That's pretty amazing. Um, and that's kind of what you want to do is you want to kind of, you know, have those adaptability while you're, you know, answering their questions and welcoming them as well as just, you know, checking in on their needs. Next slide. So I bled into a little bit of my next slide, which is let things unfold. Once you set everything up, um, the event is the teacher. And that's the tactile part that I referred to earlier. You know, once they get to move through the event and they kind of get um, acclimated to the event, their personalities start to emerge. And this is my favorite part. It's the magic. Um, the slide, that, the picture that I had, had selected here is purposeful. Um, this is our last repair cafe and that young woman's name is Hoodie. And, sh and this was the first time our, our computer folks couldn't show up because they were graduating from high school. And um, but he just sat down with a small kit of tools and just started a computer, um, you know, a computer station just right there. Um, and that's how things unfold. She just did it. Um, we had young people who were um, assisting in other places and then realized that they needed kind of a gluing station, you know, to glue pieces and, and things back together again. And they just, and then that just emerged. You know, that's the kind of organic unfolding that you want to happen um, is, uh, you know, and that's where you're going to have the young people finally start to get permission and um, enjoy the event, feel empowered, um, feel like people are listening to them. They're going to be helpful. And um, these are all the things that's going to tie the whole mission together. Um, so next slide. Couple things that don't fit into my comments. I just wanted to say that you know, if you're engaging young people, you know, one of the ways that you can kind of see, you know close the deal with them if they're hesitating about volunteering is telling them that they can bring friends. Like that's a great thing that you know people want to do things in a social way. Um, parents and caregivers uh, with their children, like Lynn was talking about, like they can be repair coaches and assistants together. Don't forget to offer up any kind of documentation that they might need for any kind of. Um, community service that they might need. You know, honor societies frequently require community services as do some classes. So you'll have that for them. Um, have the next repair date handy to share with them. And, you know, I can't underscore enough that a fun, inclusive and collaborative environment means everything. Next slide. So in closing, I just wanna um, kind of repeat a couple of key points. Young people are, are integral to the repair cafe movement. They should be a solid part of your volunteer recruitment plan um, and it, it will pay off in spades. They have hidden talents. Um, they can do a lot. It's up to you to kind of mentor them and tease that out of them. It's, it, it's a blossoming that is really worth seeing. Um, they need your patience. Um, there's a phrase that I'd like to banish from all, uh, you know, all of our languages, which is, it's just common sense. You know, like when we're, especially when we're talking to young people, it doesn't even apply to young people. It could apply to you know anybody. 
but you don't know what you know till you know it. And you might be the person that teaches that young person um, something new. So try to be patient with them. Um, the benefits of their con contributions will be well worth your time. And then finally, uh, you know, youth are the key to the future of Repair Cafe. As you're saying, 2035, 2040, we are still going to be doing this. Um, and they are an, an incredibly important part of the lineage and the succession plan when it comes to Repair Cafe. And finally, next slide. So I am a, a very proud Repair Cafe, big fat nerd, and I would talk to you any day, anytime about Repair Cafe in any capacity. Please, please use my uh, number if you'd like to um, continue this conversation. And then finally, the last slide, I just have to acknowledge all these fact, you know, these people, Sustainable Hudson Valley, um, Rockland Green, the Youth Bureau, um, all the folks that make this possible. I also want a big uh, shout out to John Wackman, who um, if it wasn't for him, um, I wouldn't have been able to put um, all my uh, thoughts into action when it came to inclusiv inclusivity, youth, and repair cafe. So big thanks to that. And um, thank you for uh, listening to my comments. I appreciate it. Much indeed. I, I'm trying to skip through some of these uh, comments that have come through, but somebody, they found somebody, uh, somebody mentioned they, they uh, had somebody who was 17 or 18 that set up a repair cafe. Be interesting uh, to, know, nice. to know more about that. Uh, various other comments coming through, but uh, let, let's, uh, let's go to the next presentation and let's see if we have enough time, come back for some other other questions. I'd like to just pose one perhaps for you to think about, Kathy, uh, whilst we've got the next uh, presentation. It is certainly one of the issues in, in the in the UK, at least, are issues around so-called so safeguarding uh, to do with a, a, you know, under 18. So there is quite strict laws around that and something called DBS checks, which is checking on people's backgrounds to see if there are yeah. issues. So there's you know there is bureaucracy there's policies need to be set up you know there need to be nominated people to manage that process so so maybe if you could have a think about that in the years oh, yeah. and, then I, I'll, I uh, and, and then i'll uh, maybe we'll come back with um after bilber's uh presentation so i'll, pa I'll pass across now to, um to oh we've moved across we jumped across somewhere so not quite sure so what's happened to Bilber's presentation here. Um, um, are you okay to just speak to your uh, speak? Um, I have my presentation, Martin, if you would like me to share it. Uh, yeah, I I thought I'd include it in the deck, but clearly I have uh, uh, for some reason it's it's not got in there. Um, I'll share uh, my my presentation. If you if you could try and share your screen, that would be great. Okay. I'll do that now. One second. Um, let me just start the presentation. Okay, great. Okay, can you see my presentation, everybody? All good. Okay, right. Um, so um, my name is Billy Bakra and I organise the Spencer's Wood Repair Cafe. We've been running for 15 months and on Sunday we had our best session ever. We had 40 people attending and we managed to raise £360 for a local charity. So I'm really dead pleased with that. Um, I was um, attended the UK Repair Cafe Conference and I facilitated a roundtable discussion on engaging youth. So this is a collection of ideas from the whole of the UK Repair Cafe Conference rather than from me. And I've broken it down into uh, what, what the problem is, um, talking about different age groups, things to consider, how to create contacts with the local community and suggested activities. So, um, so I can just see the end of my slide. Just let me just move my, my, my thing to, out of the way. Right, so we've acknowledged that young people are more aware of the cause and effect of climate change, and they are looking for ways in which they can contribute to reducing the consumption. 
Um, so obviously encouraging young people to get involved in the Repair Cafe is going to be a positive move. But we then also acknowledge that the fix and repair skills lay with the older generation. And what we needed to do was seek ways in which we could pass on these skills to the younger generation, but in a fun and interactive way. So one of the other things as a group that we realised was that actually you can't just talk about young people. You needed to kind of talk about different age ranges. And so I've broken this down into three groups, um, like perhaps interacting with under 10s and they need much closer supervision. And perhaps between the age of 10 and 17, we need to engage them in projects that are of interest to them and they could bring their own uh, own items. That doesn't mean the under 10s can't, but they will need more closer supervision. And though, and I know that over 18 doesn't count as a, a kind of classification in youth, but we do need to think about the young adults as well. And there we came up with ideas of having them as, a, as apprentices and you work with more experienced supervisors so they could gain skills that way. So that's breaking down into age groups. Sorry if I'm going fast, but I only know I've only got 10 minutes to cover this. Is that okay, Martin? Yeah, okay, so things we came across um, things that we needed to consider. Um, one of the things in the UK, and it's probably true of other countries, is safeguarding young children. And in the UK, we have to create safeguarding policies and always, always ensure that no young person under 18 is left alone with an adult at any time while they are at your repair cafe. So that's vital. But the other side of safeguarding is also if you get any information given to you that you have of concern or to any of the volunteers, you need a mechanism of dealing with that side of it as well. Um, as repair cafes, we all have to do a risk assessment. This is a vital part of getting the insurance in the first place. But if you do have young people in your repair cafe actively involved, you need to make sure that they are part of your risk assessment and covered under your insurance. Um, as I mentioned earlier, you, for 16 year olds and above or whatever age rate you want, you may want to think about having them as apprentice where they can work alongside more experienced fixers. So that's one, one way to engage them. Um, we also had a lot of discussion in our roundtables about DBS checks. This is something in the UK that's required of people who work with young people. And we, were one, we did have a discussion as to whether we had to have people who had DBS checks um, in your repair cafe to work with young people. And opinions varied. And we did have long discussions, but we didn't really come to any conclusion because people had different perspectives. So I can't really say yes or no to that one, but it's something that you should really consider about what, who these young people interact with while they're at your repair cafe. Um, it, it would be great to work with schools, we all know that, but if you approach a teacher and say, oh, would, would you like your children to be involved in an after schooling activity, involving repairing items, they will say yes, but they will do nothing about it because they have no time. They are hard pressed. So one of the things that we discussed was how can we engage with schools in a, an alternative way? And one of the suggestions was um, community engagement officers. Most schools have them and they are probably your best contact to try and get into a school. Um, another approach would be uh, something called parent te teacher associations, which is where the parents and teachers work together to, to do out of school activities. So that's another point of contact. Um, in the UK, we have something called a Duke of Edinburgh Award, and that's where they have to do um, things to get their, their awards. And one of them is repairing. So that's a good set of um, um, organizations to try and contact. And as mentioned by Kathy, um, local scouts and guide, guide groups also have badges 
and so you can approach them to see if they can work with the repair cafe to get their badges and another uh, point that you could go to is organizers of youth clubs they're always looking for fun activities for their young people so we went then went on to discuss what can we actually do with these young people now that we've engaged with them and some of these ideas again uh, running work uh, running a workshop that fixes items that young people are interested in and for example toys bikes cricket pads sewing them up skateboards xboxes switches all kinds of things and also if it's theirs they are they're more invested in it as well another example was running art projects um, Perhaps they could create a poster for your website or just posters in their own right. That would mean they, they would have to do some research into a repair cafe and find out what a repair cafe actually does. So that's kind of two phase thing there. Or perhaps a model. Um, they could um, create a, an art model of something to do with repair cafes. Um, other um, repair cafes in the UK have been made, making bird boxes and again as Kathy mentioned bug hotels so this could be partially prepared where they finish it off or it could be created from scratch encouraging them to bring old fence panels to tree stumps and so that brings in the environmental and recycle part of it as well um, and just lastly I just wanted to cover some more activities to engage with young people um, encourage them to go to charity shops, buy items and then run a workshop on how to alter and repair items and make them more fashionable. Uh, you could run workshops to alter prom dresses, jackets, trousers, so they might have bought something, they need to make it tighter, make it longer, whatever, you could um, run a workshop around that. And in the UK, we often have family members come along with the volunteers, um, for example, running as runners, making sure everybody's OK, making sure everybody's got refreshment. Or in my case, I have a young girl who who runs a make me off, make me an offer table, which we've had items donated and she then sets it all up and she manages it herself and she loves it. Um, so the runners could also help ensure volunteers have refreshments and tools they require and engage with the visitors. So these are some ideas that have come up from the UK Repair Cap Conference last month. Thank you. Thanks, uh, Billy. And uh, yeah, just a bit of experience from our side is uh, we certainly, it was amazing to see, we had a couple of uh, Duke of Edinburgh's uh, kids uh, and it was amazing to see the growth in their confidence because they worked on our front desk. So this is a, a an, so it's not just repairing, it's the front desk, as you were saying, the, the, the interaction with people. I think the other key thing that is perhaps worth noting where you, you one doesn't have to get into some of these, uh, you know, let's say uh, policy issues is if there is the, you know, father and daughter or mother and daughter mother and son so as if there's a parent there you know there there's less of these challenges um that that has to has to be uh faced so that's another aspect at least from our experience but but going back to to kathy what is the situation there around some of these challenges in the u.s, US in terms of legislation and um etc cetera, etc cetera? I think you know you hit the nail on the head, no pun intended, when it comes to bureaucracy. Um, uh, there is no specific le legislation that requires, at least I can speak for New York, um, that requires background checks for this type of audience. However, um, in my another hat that I wear through AmeriCorps, um, our, our people who are 18 or older need to be background checked to participate in AmeriCorps items. So um, when it comes to Repair Cafe, a lot of times, probably 60% of our volunteers are background checked. Um, it, you know, it's always, I think that it's going to be a formidable challenge um, should volunteers be required to be background checked. I don't necessarily I think of any protective, um, you know, measure is going to be a good thing as long as it's, you know, of course, cost effective and, and kind of easy to do. Um, that could be the big uh, challenge, though. 
Um, and, you know, I mean, everything that we do is out in the open and complete, you know, that we, we don't do anything in rooms, everything's big open spaces, everybody's accompanied, um, but I know that, you know, won't be sufficient for some people. Do we, do we have any uh, questions or observations uh, from the audience? Uh, maybe you can put your, your hand up or wave or... Uh, So, uh, yeah, I sort of noted that uh, somebody had mentioned that they have even eight and five year olds attending and they like to screw uh, to unscrew and rescrew things. So that was sort of quite interesting. Um, uh, so Sat has a has his hand up. Hi, everyone. I don't know if you can hear me. Yep, we can hear you. Oh, brilliant. So basically, we, we had our first uh, Replay Cafe this weekend, and one of the uh, organizations that supported us was the local municipality, local council. And uh, they suggested in the mix, they said, why don't you have a session that brought in, you know, kids and have them learn about repair? Uh, we were a bit nervous to do that on our first one because of all of the issues that everyone's been discussing earlier. Um, but they were interested in connecting us to an organization the, that teaches kids about repair through schools. They have these kits they, that they send to schools. I'm sure, Martin, you know them, Team Repair. Um, and Team Repair, a bunch of university grads who basically came up with this idea to create kits of devices, phones, similar things that are slightly broken. And then the schools um, teach the kids um, through a curriculum aspect uh, on how these could be repaired. And so we, we probably will involve them in the future but uh we didn't want to do that straight off the bat yeah great thanks thanks for that um any other comments or observations uh, is that is that elizabeth waving a hand elizabeth knight yeah you want to unmute yourself elizabeth all right can you hear me now yeah um, we didn't have a lot of success um, getting kids from the local BOCES, and i don't know why we reached out several times but one of the easiest places that we found to get them was um, from church groups. Many of them required that the kids have community service hours in order to be reach confirmation. We had a team of seventh and eighth graders who were wonderful, both as greeters, helping people carry things in through the door. And then one mother contacted me ahead of time and said, her child had been working with his father to repair small engines since the time he was six. And could he do that? And I said, yes, but he has to sit next to an adult. And um, I see Fix-It Bob is here. And I think that boy worked with Fix-It Bob and your pal, Rich White. Um, and if I remember the story, he was repairing lamps with Bob. And then someone uh, brought in a lawnmower. And the kid leapt from behind the table, went over, helped the woman put the lawnmower on top of the table. And according to the adult, Rich, who was a friend of Bob's, the other coach, he said the kid diagnosed the problem accurately in under 60 seconds. At the next repair cafe, the seventh grade boy brought another friend of his to work with him under adult supervision. Um, and then one of the other favorite ones was a woman who brought in a handheld hairdryer to be fixed and it couldn't. And she said, well, where's the uh, recycling box? And one of the coaches said, take it over to the kids, take it apart table. And she said, oh, you mean the reuse play station where the adult had cut off the plugs and had taken the thing apart safely for the kids to work on to a greater degree with their little tiny screwdrivers. But, and he, his name was, um, escapes me at the moment, but he provided an entire list of recommended safe items for children to work on that's in the appendix of the book that John Wackman and I co-authored called Repair Revolution. And that turned out to be very successful, particularly with young younger kids. We had a harder time with high school. Thank you. Thank, thanks, Elizabeth. Uh, I see Steve and Gilles. Uh, just one quick comment is... Uh, we, we've also tried to engage stu students as well uh, because we're co-located near a, a large uh, design school. Uh, but one of the the challenges uh, that we 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 found was was getting them there, uh, as uh, as uh, Kathy highlighted. 
because repair cafes for certain types of students may not be seen as cool. But once we got them there and they started to see it and they started to see, you know, how their repairers work, they suddenly got much more interested. So I really resonated with what Kathy was saying there about getting them, getting them there in the first place to experience it. So Steve and then Gilles. Steve uh, Crickler. Yeah, thank you. Um, I have a 13 year old son and he's always seen me repairing things around the house and help in the garden, repairing tools and things. So several times I've taken him along. I'm a regular at our repair cafe for the last couple of years, but he often comes along. And a nice little anecdote, he's very keen being 13. He's keen on fixing computers and he made his own computer and things. Um, and a few months ago, somebody brought in an old game, electronic game system, um, the precursor to a PlayStation, which wasn't working properly. And my 13 year old had a look the, the game was older than he was, but he managed to get it going and fix it. Um, and just another thing to share, we, we've our local repair cafe in Kenilworth in uh, Warwickshire. Uh, we've been to a couple of schools. Uh, primary schools, so sort of eight, nine, ten year olds. Um, we've taken things, they've brought stuff in, their toys and things that needed repairing, and we've taken things in for them to take apart, see how they work, and put it together again. And they love it. So they're, they're certainly primed for the future. Stephen. Just before Pastor Shields, it just reminded you of, of from our repair cafe, one of the things that we've historically done is we've been out, I think, to some Cubs and Scouts. And by going out to the schools or these groups, you uh, you actually fall within their uh, policies for for safeguarding whatever, which means you don't you don't necessarily you don't have to deal with all that bureaucracy within your own repair cafe. So it's another strategy to get out there without those challenges. So Gilles. Yes, thank you. Uh, well, uh, just uh, well, some 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 of uh, our um, initiatives with children. We we found uh, many many libraries uh, 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 are really interested in uh, hosting our um, our events uh, with children, but always with parents present. This is not daycare. Uh, sorry to be blunt, but uh, this is uh, this is very important to to say that. And uh, so parents must be there, must be with children, and we can do many many things with children. We can uh, uh, teach them how to use tools, how to use uh, soldering, how to use uh, multimeters, uh, how to uh, how how to sew. That's uh, with teenagers, 14, 15 years old, three three hours very quiet sewing some uh, some <laughs> some bags of things like that and it's really impressive how curious they are and how they want to learn and to understand uh, how it works how how you do things how you manage to uh, to improve your uh, your knowledge and uh, that's really really interesting very very uh, uh well uh, it, it gives uh, a lot of um energy actually and uh, i put on uh, in the comments i put a link to um, to our uh, zoom sessions every monday uh, sorry it's only in french but it, that's a good that's a benefit from covid uh, period in the sense that uh, we started to to make uh, distant uh, repair cafes and uh, each monday uh, each monday evening uh, there is a, a repairing session uh, and people are like us someone is repairing in his uh, in his house or apartment and uh, there are two or three or four uh, fixes that can help and advise and uh, and tell them yeah you should use this tool and you should use this and uh, they, 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 they help in finding the, the repair manuals or or giving advices and on how to uh, to uh, fix or uh, to uh, to find the, the way to uh, to to to, to uh, disassemble uh, an object and this is this is really nice but it's only for french uh, speaking people so if you want to join there is the link in the in in the comments and uh, finally about the repair uh, cafes for uh, for children 
these are uh, special repair cafes that you can, uh, if you don't do soldering, you can do without electricity. So it's very mobile and you can do that in places you, you don't often go to repair. So uh, we had some, uh, some larger events and we used in the nearby, uh, nearby these events, we used uh, squares or parks and uh, with the, we, 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 we relieved the children and the parents with our some simply tables and, and chairs and, uh, and screws and, uh, and some, uh, some toys and uh, multimeters. And, uh, and it was very nice to uh, teach them how to uh, understand how things work and how things could be disassembled or, or, or uh, understood. Brilliant. So, so what I suggest is maybe an eight minute break, Lou break, coffee break, uh, wine break, beer break. Uh, and then we come back in about 10 minutes uh, for the, 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 the final session around, uh, you know, uh, different repair cafes that, you know, challenges at startup, you know, the opportunities, particularly the how repair, cafe, you know, uh, older repair cafes have evolved and changed. So, 10 minutes and then we'll have the final session. Um, so see you in 10 minutes. <laughs> so, so guys, uh, do you want to, Jan and Mikhail, do you want to kick off with your presentation and I'll move it forward, you know, on a next slide sort of yeah. basis. Yeah, okay. Um, well, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, good morning to some of you. Uh, my name is Michiel Tucker. I am a um, representative for Repair Cafe Delft in the Netherlands. Um, we are one of the somewhat more uh, established uh, repair cafes in the Netherlands. And Martina asked me to, to tell you something about how we started and what we're doing uh, today. Next slide, please. So um, Repair Cafe Delft started actually on January 28, 2012. Um, back then, we were quite a small organization, approximately 10 people. Uh, we held about one meeting each month and started actually as an initiative from um, Milieu Defensie, which is a Dutch environmental or climate group um, and uh, a couple of volunteers from their network. Um, with uh, a lot of support from what I heard from uh, Repair Cafe International. My, I myself was not present at the time, but uh, I joined later on. Um, but we started in a single location uh, with a small group but Repair Café Delft has um, steadily grown uh, since then. Next slide, please. So these days, um, Repair Café Delft is a foundation under Dutch law uh, with all the appropriate registrations, which actually helps a bit when talking about subsidies due to municipalities. Um, being in the city of Delft, we have a good relationship good cooperation with the Technical University Delft. Um, they, for instance, they allow us to use their uh, student workshop for our meetings free of charge. Uh, we also work with uh, several sustainability uh, groups in Delft, which also allow us to, to have, um, host meetings at their uh, facilities. Uh, we have over 70 volunteers between 28 and 82 years old. Um, quite a big group. Approximately 20 to 40 people are present at the, the regular meetings. Um, we host meetings uh, on the first and third Saturdays of each month. And uh, we do that on two locations in the Delft uh, city. Uh, we always have one repair meeting at the, the Delft University, at their science center, their student uh, workshop. And we have one uh, repair meeting either at the Delfshove uh, uh, Retirement Home, which allows us to use their, um, their hall uh, for repairing, or in the summertime um, at the Stunt uh, Upcycling Campus, which is a uh, local uh, sustainability group in Delft. And all these organizations allow us to use their facilities uh, free of charge, which is really nice. Um, with those, well, four um, repair meetings each month, we manage to do approximately 100 repairs. It varies a bit. 
Um, we have about a 60% success rate with an additional 20% um, half repaired or advising or just waiting for, for spare parts. Most of our marketing happens through the local newspaper, of course. Uh, we have banners, which we um, can show in the, the, the Delft city. Um, these days, the municipality is being a bit difficult about that, but that actually provides us some nice, nice uh, marketing. We, of course, do social media, uh, but most of our visitors um, hear about uh, Repair Cafe Delft through word of mouth, or they're simply uh, repeat visitors. Um, at each of our locations, uh, we have our own storage. Um, so they allow us to store our tools and equipment at those locations, uh, spare parts, and of course, a lot of consumables. Uh, we do have to provide those, uh, those things ourselves, uh, but we do not, don't need to move them around for each meeting, which saves a lot of time. And we are actively working on uh, safety during our, our meetings. Um, so working methods with also uh, personal protection equipment we provided. Of course, we have our own website shown on the slide uh, since 2012. I thought it was uh, uh, built uh, later on, but uh, building these sli uh, slides, I heard that the, the website was actually launched five days after the first meeting. So that started early on. Next slide, please. Um, since 2020, uh, we have started uh, allowing visitors or requiring visitors to register uh, repairs in our own uh, repair monitor, and we assign each repair their own time slot. Um, in 2020, this was, of course, required during COVID uh, because we needed to manage the number of people visiting our, our meetings at the same time. We need to um, uh, manage the, the flow through our, our uh, locations. Um, the additional benefit, of course, that our volunteers were able to, to log in to the system with their own accounts. And they can choose the repairs that they're interested in and also prepare for those uh, repairs. So you can search for documentation, uh, you can order spare parts beforehand, uh, look for repair manuals, those kind of things. Um, communication with visitors and volunteers then usually takes place via phone or, or email. Um, and the system is built on a um, commercial available system, uh, web-based system. So that includes all the uh, privacy regulations and, and personal data is protected and only accessible to, to the uh, authorized users. Um, since all the, the COVID uh, misery has ended, uh, we can also take repairs again uh, for people who don't register beforehand and who just come by to the meeting. So that's a bit more, a bit more uh, spontaneous. Um, but of course, you don't get a chance to, to prepare uh, beforehand. Um, since then, we've uh, asked each volunteer uh, to tell us how many scheduled repairs he or she wants to do. And that varies per, per person. But that allows us to um, create a planning and it leaves some space in the planning for all the uh, walk-ins, the, the unplanned repairs. So this is a system that we uh, are still maintaining up to date, um, and we plan to uh, do that in the future. Um, that was my presentation. Next slide. Yeah. Um, so that's a bit about us, uh, Repair Cafe Delft. Um, please let me know if you have any questions. Maybe I'll just ask one question and then uh, we can go into the other other presentation and pick up some general questions at the, at the end so so i mean our, our experience within covid we developed a sort of online triage system people could book in you know their slots etc cetera, etc cetera, and it worked really well uh i mean there's a lot more back office to do it um in yeah. terms of organization but we 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 made a decision uh to actually go back to just physical drop-in um uh despite the system working efficiently uh because it sort of worked <laughs> uh yeah. and and and, I, and it's uh, something that i've seen emerging in, in our U, a wider uk group that we have that people are looking at online systems uh and like you guys um we're not as experienced as running long running as you guys but for being around for a while 
we we sort of stuck with what works we find so i'd just be interested you seem to have like maintained a sort of hybrid sort of system could you correct. just expand on that a little yeah correct um we used to do only walk-ins um, yeah. before covid um that covid changed that of course um and after covid ended uh, we actually held an inquiry between our volunteers uh, my first expectation was actually that we would drop the, the uh, registration system, that everyone, everyone would want to go back to the walk-in system. Um, but to my surprise, I think over two-thirds uh, elected to keep the system online because you can prepare your repairs beforehand. So our, our volunteers have some idea on what is coming towards them. And they seem to really like that. So we are still a bit looking... Uh, in, into the hybrid system and how to arrange that. Um, yeah, it's still a bit trial and error. We're not there yet, I think, um, but we're, we're managing the, the, the walk-in system quite well. The problem is waiting time for, for the walk-ins. That's the main thing. Yeah, Yeah. might I add uh, on that? I hear that from other uh, participants and countries too, yeah. that for the, for the visitor, it's nice to have... Um, a uh, booked time slot to know when to arrive so that they don't have to wait for two hours. It is our experience that, uh, so in Repair Café Delft, we always also arrange the, the café part. So we always have coffee and usually some cake or, or stuff around that. Um, and that really helps with the, the waiting. People really seem to enjoy that. Yeah. But we also have to take care of our uh, volunteers and we want to um uh, have their opinion and uh, please them in the way they prefer the working and they most of our volunteers express the, the preference of this system of pre uh, pre-assigned time slots and well our uh, the volunteers they are our capital so we need to take care of that absolutely and i, I recognize that from our experience uh, Repair cafes aren't repair cafes unless you have your volunteers and you've got to look after them. And yes. we also we also learned that things uh, you know, that it was interesting that they came back saying they like the pre-reg. I mean, the other thing that came back to us along that lines was as the sort of trustees, we once made a, a decision uh, in terms of scope of the products we take, not to take, for example, flat screen TVs. Uh, but then we found that a number of the, the repairers want to do flat screen TVs. So it, it goes back to your point of just asking, keeping good dialogue going on with the repairers, exactly as you, as you said. I'm sure there'll be some more questions, but we'll know um, if Rebecca is there and you can you know, share, share your screen or try and share your screen. Um, are you there, Re Rebecca? Rebecca was there. I have um, seen her. Yeah, so did I, Martine. <laughs> but I... I, had a, I had a lot of dialogue with her by email, so I don't know what's quite happening. So I think what's going on, uh, as there seems to be a bit of uh, um, uh, variability there, I think what no, I'll she do is... She is there. I, I see her in the, in the picture. She, she's waving at us. Okay, well, can you, um, Rebecca, uh, Rebecca, can you share your screen? Because uh, I think you said you were able to do that from your side, as uh, uh, Billy I did. I see she's talking, but we don't, I don't hear her. I don't hear either. She has to unmute. Yeah. Okay, yeah. So unmute, I think, Rebecca, and I think we're in business. Oh. We can't hear you. Can't hear you. Can't hear you. Um, what I suggest is that perhaps you have a look at your audio because we I, we can't we do we can see your lips moving but we can't hear the words coming out. <laughs> so we just can't hear you. Um, so so maybe if you look at your mic and what I suggest is that uh, if you have a look at that. Uh, because I think it's at your your end somewhere that if we if uh, Darren perhaps does his presentation first and then you can sort that logistic out and then we can come back to you because at least we know you you can share your screen now which is is great so what I do is I'll, I'll pass across to Darren and then we'll come back to you Rebecca 
um, and uh, uh, for your uh, for your presentation. So give me a second, and I will bring up. So Darren, are you there? Oops, I am. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. I'll move across to your slide and just tell me when you want to, me to move to the next slide. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Uh, Darren Lindig here from, from Boise, Idaho. Uh, I work for HP. And um, we thought we would uh, do a, a repair cafe. And um, uh, we just had that last uh, a couple weeks ago. So um, just to introduce myself, I'm a material scientist. I work with uh, I'm, I'm an engineer and, and focus on laser jet quality. With, uh, within our company. Um, go on, the next slide. So I just thought we'd talk about, you know, the background, why we did this, how we did it, some results and feedback and what we learned. Uh, I know that we are a little bit different in um, in this being a, an in-house event. So I'll explain some of the details on that. Go ahead. So, so just some background um, in Boise. We are uh, we are we design and develop laser jet printers. So these are printers that you'd find in your office. And our site has around fifteen hundred employees. Um, we thought we would take advantage of our 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 community to run a, a pilot um, of such that we could um, have a little bit more control on on our event and see how it would go. Um, I myself am I'm involved with the uh, quality of refurbished components within our laser jet products. So I have a lot of uh, specific experience with, with repair uh, of our own products, um, certain aspects or certain specific products and assemblies. Uh, and, and really, we have a lot of engineers on site, uh, we, which we pull from for 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 volunteers and but we wanted to make sure that it was just this isn't just an engineering event this is uh inclusive to anybody who has a passion for for fixing or or you know circularity the next one um yeah and and, and really within hp uh, sustainability is is pretty core to our discussions it's a topic every day um, and it's pretty broad as far as our sustainability. You know, climate is one of those in, in sustainability, human rights, digital equity. And then, you know, within climate, there is a lot of um, around carbon, water, uh, waste, um, circularity being one of those, and uh, materials, forests, supply chain, operations, all that kind of really... In, we're very involved with circularity within the company. Uh, but this, you know, this event, we're bringing repair awareness, both internally, you know, as, as, as just a, a, uh, a, a person, but also bringing awareness externally um, and internally within our company. So, um, and, and as far as employee engagement, we really do encourage as in, a, in the company to, to volunteer, um, we're encouraged to take four hours per month to uh, to help um, give back to the community. And this is kind of one of those in employee activities that we can get involved with, um, and it's a, it's it's worked out well. We wanted to make sure it was a fun event for everyone, and, and I think we we definitely had some fun while we did that. I know that for some fixing is fun, and for others getting products back that you know, working condition is the fun part. So it's good for both sides of things, as as you all know. And and because we have large enough, we thought we'd run it as a pilot. We we were able to control it um, and have both our what we call our fixers and our and our participants be from inside the company. We had a little bit more control over that just to see how things would go. Go ahead, the next one. So how we did it, you know, first we had, we we made sure we had support within our company to, to host the event. We gathered up a group of uh, of 
of passionate folks around um, around repair to plan this out. We 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 called for volunteers and and we had easily had 27 fixers. Uh, we ran this on a Friday afternoon, so we had um, a good portion that were able to commit. Um, we ran through safety concerns with our facilities and our site council. Um, you know the the repair cafe assets were very helpful. The house rules um, were important as far as setting expectations. I think using the word volunteer also just helps sets that expectation of, of people that are coming in. Um, but really, you know what what to expect when you get there. What to uh, what we what we expect of the fixers. We had a fixer FAQ section section session. You know, do I need to bring my tools? Do um, you know what's provided? All those kind of things was really helpful. I think. Um, and again, the, the assets that had that were that were with the repair cafe set were really helpful in that. Um, I think communication of our event was was typical, but but more internal. You know, we use our site wide um, uh, email, posters, um, word of mouth, that kind of thing. We could probably go to the next one. Um, we also we also brought some of our tools that we could bring in that were that were already used in the company for different reasons. We we did we did furnish a microscope, which was I think helpful. We have plenty of those around site um, in a general toolbox. Uh, but beyond that, the fixers provided a lot of their specific tools of their trade. Uh, we had. Roughly 20 items that came in, 75% repair rate. Um, really typical items that I think we've seen on other repair cafe events. Um, we, uh, you know, we didn't get any bikes or garden tools, which is probably what I would have expected that we see. But I assume if we had twice the participants, we would have seen that too. Um, anyway, a variety of of products and uh, even our own products as well, which we did expect as, as well to come through. Go to the next one. So things we learned, you know, I think aligning, aligning expect, expectations was probably the, the biggest thing. You know, you don't want to have anybody that does a service event, you want to make sure that uh, you're not giving surprises, um, at least negative surprises to anybody that's coming in. And as far as the fixtures go, you know what to expect because this was really our first uh, event. And really, this repair cafe in this kind of area. Although I will say that the city of Boise put on a, a great repair cafe just the week prior. But in this area, it's really uh, a, a an unknown concept. I would say 99% of the people that we mentioned repair cafe had no idea of what this was. So I think. Um, you know, aligning the expectations for what this is and what to expect and, and what, what's going to happen is really important. Uh, the other thing that really was helpful, I think, was leveraging the fixer talents. I mean, some some people have have interest in, in fixing one thing or, you know, there's the generalists, of course, um, but just, just highlighting and communicating what those interests or specialties are, I think drives um, specificness um, of, hey, you know, we have someone who really likes to fix chainsaws. Oh yeah, it's like, oh, now I remember I had that chainsaw doesn't work very well. So I think advertising that is, was really, was, was helpful. Um, it's great to communicate the concept awareness throughout, throughout our site and our employees. Um, the uh, the idea of, of 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 repair, and then uh, and then communicating participate participating driving participation to to come in. And one of the things that I think was one of the things that we learned, um, you know, we did it in house, and and we realized, hey, you know what, it, what if what would what would be the worst case of of this event? And it was like, well, I guess we have just 
one person that comes in and we fix an item and it's like well well that's that's fine you know we it, it was it was really didn't take much to to organize this event and so even a small event you know i i to the extreme where you had one person that they wanted to fix something and uh that was your repair cafe was one person i think is is was is seemed okay so um it was great to do it at a first time event and we really didn't have big expectations and and um i think it was helpful to to think about um what we were doing as far as um we didn't need to to change the world that day um again i mentioned the the, the repair cafe assets were very helpful questions we had were really uh answered a lot of times um you know as far as um you know whether it's posters or or the the registration forms it was like oh great we'll just use this and i think that was really helpful we didn't need to invent things and then um i think creating awareness and, and those that are involved is really going to help feed and grow other repair cafe events locally uh, again i think we could get volunteers to help with the city of boise's events and i think even internally within the company there's interest in in having some of these um, hosted at other sites or or um, other people looking for repair cafes in their community go to the next one there's our there's our crew and then if we have time there's a video on the next one it's just a short little uh one minute summary video that we had uh that we had done work <laughs> yeah. Excellent. So, do do you do you see? Um, I mean, like like us back in two fourteen, we ran two tests because, you know, at that stage we didn't have any benchmarks to visit anybody in the local area to see how they'd done it, uh, and just bring in other experience. I have you test, test, test to work the processes through. Uh, on, uh, so it, it it looks like sort of oddly in parallel that the city developed one <laughs> there's something going on obviously in your city where the you know parallel processes so do you see you guys coming together i think you you or do you see you still might continue to run things independently within the facility how do you how do you see that all moving forward yeah we're just exploring i i think this i think uh i think Catherine's was online earlier or she is uh from the city of boise i i you know i they're probably gonna be more sustainable in their in their regularity of of events and i hope that we feed into them or or partner with them or 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 help them to promote things um i'm not sure if we figured out the cadence that we would do uh, whether we keep it internally we were thinking okay let's do it internally and then let's open up to the public or um you know we've also thought about other things about maybe we could we could host a, a a repair cafe specific to our laser jet products within the town that um we could open up for a day and um 
you know, that's that's a different flavor of of events. So we're still exploring what what works out best for us. I mean, have, have you started to sort of think from a sort of company perspective, as we've heard, you know, there are regular regulatory changes coming through, you know, in Europe, you know, and, and really repair cafes almost as a, as a training, experiential training to start to build knowledge and understanding for design and development teams so that they start to, you know, see the challenges, see what might start to come through over the next sort of 10 years or so. Is that it, or is that a bit far off at the moment? I think we're very aware of of initiatives that are, you know, right to repair initiatives and country regulations and and staying abreast of that. I think, um, you know, I, we are there are certain goals within the company that that are trying to improve our circularity for sure. We've got good goals in that space. Uh, I wish we could change everything all at once but it's it's you know moving the ship you know moving the moving the needle i would have thought that you know uh that this is a model that you could see other parts of maybe hp and other countries in europe you know uh maybe picking up is is that your, a hope or a thought or have you seen other interests coming in from other other parts of HP in, in Europe or around the world in what you're doing, or is it too early? Are you meaning for repair cafes? Yeah, yeah. Canada? So I could see in like you know, let's say uh, you know, if HP has a facility in the Netherlands, maybe you know, a team in a you know in in in, in the Netherlands might say, "Oh, right, that's really interesting. We've heard of repair cafes generally. All oh, right." It once just been uh, organized in Idaho, so therefore, oh, that sounds like it's been accepted by the organization as a legitimate use of time. So, you know, I could sort of see the idea, at least, you know, potentially spreading, you know, particularly in Europe, because that's where the regulatory drivers are going to emerge quicker than perhaps in other parts of the world. So, yeah, I think, I think for just for employees, as far as participating in 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 repair cafes, um, there is good opportunity to um, there. Uh, there is already good interest in um, helping in in those repair cafes. Uh, oftentimes, you know, companies and their teams are looking for team building events, and you know, attaching to repair cafes that are around to participate um there's often you know we're, there's often groups that are looking for those activities and i think there's a, a good way to connect into businesses corporations that are looking to i think is a perfect event for um for volunteering for a lot of groups i think it's wonderful that you do such a thing and to have a special laser jet repair cafe in for for the public that would be um a first time too so that would be very special if you were to do that yeah you know we're just thinking ideas i think it'd be great um you know <laughs> we might have some people complaining what about a, what about a repair cafe in our town you know so um we'll see what we can do on on trying some of those ideas which really leveraging from this uh, repair cafe movement I mean, this, this probably within the well there will be within the network there would have been hp laser jet printers that have come through the systems and probably some data and knowledge so that's interesting other side or angle but i think your point you're saying um about repair cafes apart from obviously repair you know about teach teaching collaboration teamwork all those softer skills absolutely you know uh very you can't run a repair cafe and uh, really uh, you know unless you've got that team teamwork going and, and then certainly from my experience so i've learned a lot of lessons over 80 80 odd sessions with different per people different skill sets you know dealing with it we're dealing with the customer you know with the public and so i think that that you know repair cafe is a 
living laboratory for all sorts of things is is an interesting idea i hope we have still got we'll try again rebecca are you there can you yes uh, it should work all right we can hear now. you great yes. can you can you share your share your screen yeah, of course okay great excellent so thanks darren for that Well, hello everybody. Thank you for listening to me. Um, I am Rebecca Pelter. I'm 18 years old. Um, I'm the president of the Repair Café Valoris and the secretary of the Repair Café de Biot since I am 14. I am also the treasurer uh, and the community manager of the European organization that simulate European Union institutions, debates and policy decisions uh, between young people to sensibilize them to uh, European Union. Well, uh, right now I'm in Ibiza uh, working on my Spanish and French, so please excuse me for my bad English and if I hesitate um, while talking because of the cross linguistic interferences I encounter. Um, I will talk to you about the Ripper Cafes in Biot and Valoris uh, that are in the south of France to show you the similarities and differences between these two coexisting uh, French Ripper Cafes in the same department. Uh, I have been involved in Ripper Cafes with my father, as you can see, uh, since uh, 2017, starting as an apprentice a repairer and then became, becoming a repairer myself. After attending the European event I mentioned in Paris in 2018 and 2019, I um, returned to the south of France and wanted to organize one, but someone beat me to it. However, when my father um, told me that the very first Ripper Café in Valoris had a vacant position of president, I immediately accepted the opportunity. I was thrilled, uh, especially because at that time, a law, um, a law allowing um, minors to be part of and preside over an association had just been passed. Uh, in January of 2020, I was unanimously elected as the president uh, of the Ripper Café in Valoris, while uh, simultaneously the, the Ripper Café in Biot was be being established with my father, Christophe, the president, filing the official documents. Moving into um, the, the, the administrative aspects of a Ripper Café in France, uh, let's discuss the statutes that uh, define the association and how it operates. Uh, from one Ripper Café to another, uh, the statutes can differ, uh, just like the ones for Ripper Café Valoris and Biot. Um, the statutes define the, the, the organization and the means of operation of the Ripper Café. Uh, they, are, they are voted uh, on and filed with the, the, the prefecture, the, the state. The state. Um, to secure a municipal venue for our repair cafes, um, which are uh, a political and neutral, uh, we prefer to work directly with the local municipalities. Um, this, in this involves uh, signing a convention, uh, which can be quite extensive, three sets of 20 pages, detailing 60 signatures, um, making the process lengthy. Furthermore, these conventions uh, can vary from one, in one municipality to another. Uh, for example, in Biot, uh, it is rel relatively straightforward as the municipal services are flexible. However, in Valoris, uh, it requires more effort as the, as the municipality imposes additional electrical safety requirements that prevent us from hosting um, monthly events. The cost of implementing this safety measure uh, is a concern for the municipality, which differs from other municipality in, in this regard. Lastly, it is mandatory for Ripper Cafés in France to have uh, insurance coverage, and our partnering insurance France is MAIF. The insurance contract is highly specific with a maximum capacity limit of 50 people at any given time um, in the, the, the workshop area. The contract includes a deductible, but it provides coverage for both material um, and bodily damages incurred by our volunteers and the public. Plus, uh, one of us have to get a, a PSC1, uh, the first aid uh, qualification. In our repair cafes, we have a dedica dedicated 
four team consisting of two, three, or four individuals who handle all the organiz organizational aspects. Um, this includes logistics, administrative tasks, um, liaising with the municipality, uh, its officials and departments, managing purchasing, purchases, sorry, um, transporting uh, tools for the repair cafes, uh, coordinating uh, with volunteers, collecting articles, addressing public inquiries prior to workshops, uh, managing website and social media updates, applying for grants, uh, obtaining insurance certificates, uh, brainstorming uh, projects to raise awareness about repair cafes, and my roles great, greatly contribute to, uh, to these responsibilities. Communication is indeed the main challenge we face. It is simple, no communication equals no attendees, which in turn leads to a lack of, um, of volunteers and, and vice versa. We critically lack communication. One of the most successful strategies was a, a one-page article about me, titled um, 50, 15 years old president of the Repair Café in the regional newspaper. It had a, a significant impact as I, as I, I was young with uh, 18,000 reads in the newspaper, in newspapers and uh, 17,000 on Facebook. It att attracted a lot of people initially, but when the buzz subsided, the attendance declined. Another successful um, approach is participating in events like the Fed des Associations, the organization's party, um, where our associations are, are showcased uh, to the public. Every year, this event uh, brings in new volunteers and attracts a large number of people to our subsequent um, workshops. Um, in Valois, uh, we have a 10 meter banner um, on, um, on a roundabout uh, announcing the upcoming Liber Café with a little article um, in, the, in the newspaper sometimes. While in Biot, we are featured um, in the quarterly magazine distributed and the resident, uh, residents of Biot um, have our next workshop announced on, on live panels, as you can see, and sometimes also have an article on the newspaper. Uh, we also promote our, our event on our website, Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, and even TikTok. Additionally, one of our volunteers sends emails to people who have previously attended the, the, the Repair Café. Um, despite all these, all these efforts, um, we still struggle to attract enough attendees. In my opinion, this, the solution is pretty simple. It's, it's easy to say. Um, to reach a wider audience, we need to make Repair Cafés trendy, uh, similar to, to thrift stores. Uh, it could even encourage them to pay less by repairing and learning that it is possible and how. Internationally, launching a me media campaign could um, help raise awareness and at the local level, um, people could easily search uh, for the nearest Ripper Café in their area. Uh, by creating a buzz around Ripper Cafés and highlighting their benefits, we can generate more interest and encourage people to, to participate in the movement. In recent years, especially uh, since the, 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 the COVID-19 pandemic, um, we have implemented successful initiatives uh, in collaboration with the Cafe in France. Uh, some of them are here. Um, when we couldn't host in-person uh, workshops, uh, I launched an appeal to other Ripper Cafés with the president of the Repair Café de Biot and the president of the Repair Café Tour. This led to the creation of Repair Café Academy initiated by, by Repair Café Paris in partnership with Repair Cafés in Brittany, uh, SCT uh, 94, Montpellier, Vence, Valoris, and Biot. We started uh, offering remote repair sessions and uh, organized on online duplex uh, events which enabled us to win the Maif Innovation Award and receive a generous grant of 1,500 euros. Now anyone can connect to a Repair Cafe workshop via Zoom and repair their, their ATM with us. 
and by the way, you all uh, you you are all welcome to join us, and the link uh, can be found uh, on our website. Recently, we participated in the Eco Citizen Festival organized by the City of Biot with the theme uh, "Recycle uh, Instead of Throwing Away." We set up a giant Ripper Café booth that required a lot of organization and time. The Ripper Café de Biot invited 12 associations to, um, to join the booth with around 40 volunteers, including eight, nine Ripper Cafés, a hike lab, a repair learning association, and our partner, Unix Azure, which is um, an organization um, specialized uh, in installing uh, Linux uh, software uh, on obsolete computers. It was a great success, and uh, we conducted numerous uh, workshops at the booth, enga engaging with the, the, the festival attendees. Lastly, we have experimented with theme workshops, which sometimes work well and sometimes not, but we persist in our efforts. Uh, one example is the, the repair learning workshops designed to raise awareness among children. We organize fun and educational games and um, and also swing uh, workshop. For instance, uh, we had a workshop where people could create their own uh, medieval dress or outfit uh, for the largest Templar uh, event in France, which took place in Biot. This uh, theme workshop allows us to engage with different audiences and um, and promote the values of repair and sustainability in creative. Uh, and uh, interactive ways. Lastly, we have observed that volunteers come and go and the number fluctuates. Sometimes uh, in, a, in a Hyper Café, we have five volunteers, while other times we have 10, um, maybe less, maybe, maybe more. It can be challenging to maintain a consistent volunteer base. Um, especially after the post-pandemic period, when uh, people have m become more individual individualistic uh, and community engagement has decreased, particularly in associations. Um, nevertheless, we continuously launch volunteer recruitment campaigns. And one factor that, that encourages volunteers to stay engaged is the, the, the tradition of uh, having an aperitif at the end of each workshop, uh, this social gathering fosters uh, a sense of camaraderie and uh, provides an opportunity for volunteers to connect and bond, making the experience more enjoyable and, um, and then encouraging their, their, their continued involvement. Indeed, uh, running the Repair Café requires a significant time investment and it is an ever uh, changing endeavor. Uh, we have noticed a significant decline in overall association involvement and commitment, but we persist in our efforts to combat this trend every month. Uh, we understand the importance of maintaining a strong and dedicated team, and we continuously work uh, towards fostering a sense of belonging and commitment uh, among uh, our volunteers. Despite the, the challenges, we remain uh, committed to the mission of the Ripper Café and the positive impact it has on our community and the environment. Thank you for listening, for having listening to me. I, Rebecca, I hope you're happier now rather than being sad. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so uh, great that you, you we we brought we got through the technology and all the the other difficulties. So very great presentation. So I missed a little bit at the beginning, but perhaps yes. you sort of clarify a little bit. So you're now yes. eighteen, but you yes. you became the the sort of president of the Repair Cafe when you were fifteen. So, Fourteen. And, uh, 40. It was uh, in in January, and I turned fifteen in Mar March. Yes. So, so you'd been involved with your father, and then you were you know, and um, you know, it's quite a significant. I would say it's unique for an existing repair cafe to have uh, voted in a young person as the president. How did that come about? Because it's very, it's very, very innovative and very uh, unusual. So, 
what what was the the background to that well um first um my father re repairs everything and i always i always was the the little ants behind him uh passing him uh, the the everything uh, and uh highlighting him and uh it thanks to him and it it interested me uh, in in repairing things and not throwing away and uh, mom if you're listening to me i know you don't like all the things that we bring home trying to repair them but um yes uh, th there's this thing um uh, about uh, organizations that um attracted me uh, at the beginning and still today um making bonds, uh, meeting people. Uh, the Repair Cafes are, are it's, a, it's a concept uh, the, 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 which is very, very social, uh, which is very open to people. Uh, we, we give time to people. So yes, uh, it, was interest, it was interesting. Uh, I liked the, the, the fact you were organize, organizing, organizing things, uh, events, uh, the, the workshops uh, uh, and everything. And uh, yeah, and everything have have um, worked by itself, petit à petit, little by little, and uh, and sometimes it, it's very hard uh, when you're young because there's the thing that I'm I'm I was I was and I'm still a young girl, and there's this I'm the the coordinator, the 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 the, the, peop, the person that says what to do, uh, that, that encourage what to do, uh, when, uh, uh, that asks some help. And sometimes it's, it's pretty hard because when they are uh, adults um, that are 40, 50, 60, and see a, a little girl or a young girl uh, telling them what to do, uh, how to do uh, everything, it's there's um there's a distance and it was pretty hard and now that i'm uh that i am 18 and i'm a i'm a major person it's um, a little bit more more okay because i can now i can manage the bank accounts and i can uh, decide uh, more things and uh and with time people uh people are uh, in the, the 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 associations in the two repair cafes uh have uh, have accepted me Great. Well, that, that it's, it's fantastic and great to hear, you know, three fantastic cases coming from different perspectives and uh, each of which have, a, you know, unique, unique sets of uh, issues. And, and particularly the, the second may be interesting visions for the future. I mean, it, it's already heard, you know, that we thought, I mean, it, when we asked then uh, earlier on about young people in the other session, you know, running repair cafes, and and we thought, oh wow, somebody was eighteen or seventeen, and you and you were fourteen or fifteen, you know, and running it. So that's great. So how 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 long? When was the repair cafe originally launched? Uh, sorry, I didn't hear you. Uh, when was the repair cafe originally launched? Was it uh, you know what an early one or? Uh, it was uh, it was uh, in 2020, just before the COVID, and uh, uh, the the president, uh, the, the 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 founder president, did the things to political people that uh, didn't want him in the the Ripper Cafe, so he abandoned his post, his his job, and um, and when I became president, we were in a small, very small. Uh, um, place and then we had a um, as i said a, a municipal venue okay great well that's fantastic do you want to stop sharing your screen now yeah, rebecca or, and then uh, enough of this cat yeah <laughs> uh so does anybody have any questions or observations they want to bring up i i know particularly uh you know we, it's early in some places and later in others so uh, does anybody have any particular comments or observations they want to bring in? You know, um... Well, I have one more question for Rebecca. Um, because young people, um, 
not usually have much time to do volunteer work. Um, where do you find the time? Um, I didn't go to school this year. Okay. No, no, no seriously, no, no, seriously. Um, no, the, there's always time. People are, that are working have time. Uh, it's more, um, it's more volunteering. It's more um, involvement. I, 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 I asked uh, young people my of my age why didn't they want to go in association and organizations? And uh, it's not because of time. It's not because of studies. Uh, maybe the, the 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 medical studies or 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 or, or the, the 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 right studies but it's more that um it it doesn't interest them because they see it at, um as um all people think and it's it's sad to say this but it's real mm -hmm. and uh, when i said to make hyper cafes trendy uh it is because um hyper cafes um, the, the the communication works. Um, I, I, I talk in in my opinion, in my perspective of Hyper Cafes in France, in the south of France, which is a, a department that is pretty old, and uh, it only touch um, a, a a class of people, all people uh, uh, that, that 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 are not working anymore. And if the Hyper Cafe is trendy, like I said, the thrift stores, vintage, all the things that is second hand. Uh, maybe they will say, oh, okay, I want to be like everybody. And it's sad to say this, but young people mostly, not everybody, but mostly think like this. And uh, maybe it could interest them uh, that people uh, could, young people, young people and, 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 and workers that are 20, 30, 40 uh, could, uh, could just go or visit. And say, oh, it's pretty cool. Um, there's a there's an aperitif at the end. Uh, uh, there's a there's a good ambience, and then uh, can 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 return. Can can say, I want to now. I want to repair my own things. I don't want to rebuy a, a, a machine like a, a, a coffee machine uh, uh, every year or every every two years now. And if it becomes trendy, maybe more people from other other ages can can come to Riba Cafe. Yeah. That's what we're working on. Yes. <laughs> How do you think it can become more trendy? Because an issue we observed was particularly young, young creative students, they saw it as a little bit boring uh, uh, initially uh, until they went into the repair cafe, as was said earlier, once they got in there, they were really interested, but it's just making it, getting them through the door. But it, it, there's interesting studies in psychology and in, in communication uh, that, uh, that, that tells us that um, to, to make it trendy, like the thrift stores, there's this virtual thing, this uh, harassment in every social media every social media, when they open Instagram, when they open Facebook, when they open Twitter, when they open TikTok, when they open Google, they have recommendation. Uh, have you tried Hyper Cafes? It's so cool with, with uh, people that say, uh, uh, my, my, uh, my 18 years old uh, uh, radio didn't work until then and, and, uh, and a guy or a man or a woman uh, repair, repair me my, my radio and harassing, harassing, harassing. It's the only way, Vinted and the thrift stores, it, it's harassment. And at the end, it's, it's a, 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 fen, a phenomenon that works on everybody. Like, oh, have you seen this? And then there's this, you know, the, 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 the trend uh, is created. Mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's at the beginning that uh, we have to work, not in the, the, the repair cafes. It's pretty cool. The repair cafe, the concepts, mm -hmm. the, the, the workshops are, are pretty cool. It's, it's uh, uh, the communications. It's yeah. how you discover it. Yeah. It's, it's the way it is communicated and, and a, yeah, join it, see it you know, uh, participatory and engagement. So do we have any other comments uh, or thoughts or any particular issues that anybody would like to bring up? Because we've got a few minutes more. 
uh but you know as i say it's it's still i don't know what time in the us and i i'm not sure where everybody is now now on the screen i mean i i guess in the netherlands it's nearly seven o'clock uh and, and we may be even further i think we're into some people were joining from israel and places so we're probably further across uh the world there um anybody want to bring up any points oh yes, yes there's Jan there yeah. yes can you make sure that we get uh, some sort of screen transcript of the chats because i i saw a lot of chats passing by but i couldn't read them all so can you make sure that we all get it be sending both the link to the recording and the chat will be sent to everybody as well so uh you know that, that that's uh to continue the dialogue and the discussion for all of us uh so unless i can see anybody sh waving or you know putting their hand up there's a there's a hand up from something somebody with a lot of letters in it that says something macbook at the end is it v, v y m l e v r i n k is it were you putting your hand up to make a comment y yeah yeah i can't unmute yeah. yourself okay yeah. ah i had to unmute myself sorry yeah, yeah. uh okay i'm i'm vincent Vincent from the Netherlands. I'm involved in Repair Cafe. I'm now staying in the south of France. And I, 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 I wanted to let you know that I enjoyed every minute of this uh, webinar. It's very interesting. And I, I, I won't tell you what we are doing and what, <laughs> what we are involved in, but um, I had uh, I got some very great ideas, and I want to thank everybody for the great opportunity to uh, to get involved in all this. Thank you very much. Well, great, thank you very much for that feedback. And I mean, one of the things about repair cafes is that it's so rich. Everybody has a story. Everybody wants to tell their story, and, and I think we maybe martin and i should think about more of these sorts of events maybe maybe more than one a year maybe two a year or something um and uh martin and i will get together and have a chat i think that's a good <laughs> idea martin <laughs> <laughs> and as for, for me um i think it's it's great to hear so many inspirational stories from you all and i'm really uh well this sort of events really makes me happy to see how um, committed you all are and how resourceful and how international. And this gives me confidence in the future that we together as a movement can bring some good back to our communities and to our society and to the future. And uh, I hope that you will continue much longer and um, expand and share your ideas and inspire each other and if we do that then we can come a long way Corinne, your hand is up um just to say about young people we have a young welcomer who does the registration who's 17 and it's great to have her there and volunteering for your CV to go to university is another great incentive. It's true. Maybe there's a need for a young, a young person's repair cafe net because what we've learned today is there's prop you know there's a there's at least groups of young people leading the repair cafes in Europe and and us that we weren't perhaps so aware of and at least i wasn't aware of in, 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 in you know so that's really interesting to hear about that so again last call last call at the bar does anybody uh want to make any final comments or has any further thoughts if not thank you all very much for your engagement and uh you will hear from martin and i about some events in the future Maybe a last thing. Yeah, yeah, sure. In. Sure. Um, I think this kind of uh, event uh, is really, really interesting to uh, 
to recall that a uh, Repair Cafe is a foundation and that we all do the same thing and we can all do now with, with the tools that we have, uh, do uh, things together. And even if you're uh, in America, in the USA, and I'm in France or in, uh, the, the, in, in India, in the Netherlands and everywhere. 100%. It's very international. I think this the replicability of the model. It works. You know, it's is contributing to you know all sorts of issues. So, I think thank you all very much. I know we could carry on talking for the rest until midnight, <laughs> but certainly I, I uh, I'm gonna I, I think close off now. So thanks everybody. See thank you, you in the future. Thanks, okay. Martin. Yeah. Bye thanks bye. to the speakers. Bye bye. Thank you all. Bye.